Welcome everyone to the broadcast of the 2019 FIDA World Cup and apologies for our delay. We had a slight issue with one of our computers, which is actually a big issue when we don't have connection to that computer. Yeah, well, but everything seems to be resolved uh, without wasting any more time. Let's remind our viewers we have Game 3 of the finals of the World Cup, Huntington Seas, and we have the Game 3 of third place playoff. We do, and the other match, Ding Liren, yesterday with his victory, he has taken the lead, and it also means that if the world number three wins today, he will win the match already today. There will be no need for a fourth game. Right, and that would be our intro, would we start on time? But now, <laughs> knowing that there are 23, 24 moves played in this game, and it's an end game from the martial variation of Rui Lopez. Where spoiler! Black, yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> where Black has no chance to win whatsoever, well, unless Rajabov goes mad and just blunders something. Yeah, so I don't really think that the final match will end today. You are right, I'm afraid, Yevgeny, but... Uh Mathematically, it is still possible. Yeah, that's the... Ding Liren can become the first ever Chinese Grandmaster to win a FIDE World Cup. He is the first ever Chinese Grandmaster to cross 2800, the first ever Grandmaster from China to qualify to the candidates. Now, already for the second for time the he second does time. it, he has qualified to the World Cup twice in a row. That's the first in history, not only in China, but among any other grandmasters, and he may become the first ever Chinese grandmaster to win a World Cup. So, so many records to the world number three. He's been playing brilliant chess here in Hantimasisk, and today it's a very solid start. Let's just show the opening. Uh, yeah, right. So, well, they've repeated game one from there. Yeah, yeah they've repeated game one. So, well, the Rui Lopez C3, no anti marshals and Ding Liren felt obliged to go for, for D5, so the martial variation of Rui Lopez. All that was played in game one. Bishop to F5, uh -huh. Queen F3, and I believe that was, uh, well, in the first game, Knight D2 was the move that was played, right? Knight D2, later on Knight to E4. Uh, well, it, for this game, Rajabov chose bishop e3, which is the move Sergei Karyakin has played against Ding Liren in, well, in August, Singfield Cup in the United States of America, so basically a month ago, not, well, not much more than a month ago. And, well, had, Karyakin had moderate success in terms of that he got some slight advantage in the endgame, but the game has finished in a draw. So, in a way, first seeing the repetition of the same line, I thought, oh well, perhaps Rajabov kind of gives up, wants to stay solid, but then how he's supposed to win with black. But then, thinking of a tricky situation he is now, maybe that's not such a stupid choice. So you try with white, but you do not burn the bridges. Because, because if he burns the bridges, then the match is over today. Yeah, it's like we were discussing those two games matches. Game one, you want to try with white, but you don't know where you stand first. Yeah, so you don't want to lose. And here it's even weirder, because he has two games match in which he doesn't have the tiebreak if it's 1-1. So, well, technically, games three and four is like two games match. You don't want to lose game one, because it's like over immediately. So it's, well, it's an unpleasant psychological situation to be in. Okay, of course, trailing in the match is an unpleasant situation to be in. But maybe, under the circumstances, it's not such a silly choice. And he hasn't been doing badly at all in those two game matches when, for instance, even against Maxim Vashalagrov, he won in the classical part. So it's only a two game mini match that they have been playing during the knockout system until getting into the finals and, uh, well, the match for the third place. But he, he actually was one of the few players who kept on trying in the classical game. Yeah, absolutely. So now he basically has to do it again. Win a mini-match mm -hmm. in classical chess from two games. Well, yeah. one and a half guarantees him a tiebreak. 2-0, no, well, it's unlikely, but if it happens, he still wins the final. I'm trying to recall if there were any kind of such comebacks in the final. I do remember people equalizing the score, but trailing in the final, then winning the match. I in don't the classical think, part. Yeah, I don't think it ever happened. 
I also can't recall, but the, the biggest comeback, I think, will always be Sergei Karyakin's yeah. comeback against Absolutely. Peter Schiller. We keep... Uh, recalling that moment and it's such a painful part of uh, Peter Spiller's chess career. Luckily he's not the kind of person who would have a grudge on that moment that would want to pretend it didn't happen. I think he, he himself laughs at it nowadays. Um, it's a painful moment but still he, he finds the irony of it that he was leading after two classical games to nail, he only needed a draw out of the remaining two games and he had a winning position in game three. So it seems everything was going his way to win the World Cup, but then tables turned completely. Uh, yeah, all right. And so the above mentioned game between Karyakin and Dingli Ren was repeated in, game, in this game three all the way up to White's move 21. And then Karyakin, as far as I remember, has played a b5, a b5, swapped on d5, swapped on, or possibly black swapped on f3. This, this part I don't remember. Yes, so let me look up the game. So we are referring to the game of Ding Liren against Sergei Karyakin this year at the Singfield Cup, so basically just a month ago, mm -hmm. a bit over a month. A takes b5 on move 21 by white. Yeah. A takes b5, bishop takes d5, c takes d5. And rook a5. Ah, rook a5 not swapping the queens, and it was black to capture on f3, right? Later on. Mm -hmm. Immediately after rook a5, Ding Liren took on f3, knight takes f3, rook e8, and b4. White had a slight pressure, and actually later on it seemed a promising position. So, Rajab was thinking could be is that Ding Liren had this exact same line at the Singfield Cup. And he wasn't comfortable in that game. So does he have an improvement in comparison to that game? Yeah. Or does he think that that's just a defendable position even if it's uncomfortable and unpleasant to play? Yeah, right. So we'll, we'll see how it unfolds. So Rajabov comes up with a novelty himself or a new move to, for Ding Li Ram. Queen f5, bishop takes f5 and knight e4. Trying to, mm, well, to see his... Uh, a pair of bishops, right? Well, so either to take on d6, or if the bishop moves away, then I suspect knight c5 will be played. So trying to make it uncomfortable for black. And that's the moment in the game where Ding Li Ren starts thinking. At some point, he had 1 hour 33 on his clock, blitzing all those opening moves. And so already 11 minutes spent in this position after knight e4. So we might be, might be up for an actual game and not just a, you know, just a test of memories. And this might be another smart choice by Rajabov, who did find interesting lines to play against so many of his opponents, including Jeffrey Shong and Maxim Vashela Grav. So we cannot outrule that the Azari Grandmaster actually came to this game having the idea that he will put pressure on Ding Liren and he will try to tie the score after yesterday's uh, painful loss, which actually, after the game, he didn't seem to be that disappointed. He said that it's a part of chess life. There can be losses. It's okay. And uh, he gave credit to Ding Liren for playing a very strong game. He said that when your opponent plays a very strong game and you play worse, it's normal that you lose the game. Yeah, right. You can't really... Mm. Well, Ding Liren, you can't deny he played a brilliant game yesterday. And, and Indeed. Well, those explanations he, he has given, that was, was impressive. Mind-boggling. And he was out of the book himself. He wasn't sure how that variation went, just the bone sacrifice line that he played with castle queen side and whether queen takes c5 and then d6. He wasn't sure himself, but he basically came up with all the moves that would have been following the database and even better ones when he showed us his calculation in the middle mm, game. Yeah. Well, speaking of Maxim Vashilograv and his game number three in the third place playoff against Yu Yangi. Uh, well, if you have Maxim Vashilograv playing with the black pieces and white opens with one d4, guess what? There will be a grunful defense plate. That's precisely what has happened. C takes, knight takes, reaching this position in the grunful after bishop g7. Uh, I don't quite recall what was the game one. Was it the bishop b5 check line? Uh, no. Uh, no, Here, wait. no, they didn't wait, there play was, this. There was this was uh, Russian, Russian system. Yeah, there was... Uh, the bishop b5 one was uh, against Jeffrey. Was this, knight f3, bishop g7, queen b3. That was the line. 
That was a very sharp line that they had in game one. Yeah, so now white takes on d5, goes e4, after bishop g7, no queen a4, no bishop b5, is, but bishop c4, knight e2, which is known to be a very, very solid and at the same time, it used to be challenging line at times of Karpov Kasparov matches. Indeed, indeed. And I was just going to say about the bishop b5 line that we saw that in the Rajabov Shiong uh, match. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, well, and uh, Maxim has had this position against Sergei Karyakin once again. So once again, it's Karyakin, once again, it's Sinfield Cup this year. Feels and like Sergei Karyakin is the reference player in, in all these lines. But yeah, it's Sinkfield Cup, Sergei Karyakin. I'm going to bring up that game too. Yeah, but that, was, uh, that featured a deviation at a very, very early stage. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like move eight or something. Not even sure if knight c6 was played, because... You can castle it. short, yeah? So the first game <laughs> and this variation occurred it was in 1931. 1931. So not a new opening. It was 92, yeah? Mm, yes. And Still can't their find. Game, well, of course, uh, Carlson's fiddler, Aronian Grishuk, Topalov Anand. No, that, that's. that's uh, the classics. A lot, a lot of games were played, of course. Oh, where is Korea? Uh, well, know? okay. Any, There's so many. I anyhow, I'm 100% sure that knight c6, d5 is not the position that they had. I mean, that's found something. It. Yeah. I found it. And also uh, Maxime against Anish in St. Louis. Ah, same thing. So that was the bishop e3 line. That's the main move on ah, right. move so 9. On move 9, after knight c6, bishop e3. Yes, that was the game uh, for Karvyakin and Vashiel Graf. And against Anish, now I'm curious. Against Anish, it's the same year, so this year, so for some reason I don't remember the game. Uh, Giri against Vashiel Graf. Where is it? Wait a second, I lost track of uh, the database. It was also Bishop E3, Castle, Castle B6. Uh, it was the same except for move 11. Yeah, yeah. Where in the Karyakin game it was D takes C5, and in Anish's game it was move 11, rook C1. Uh, right. But both of them being much more common, both of those positions being much more common than the move Yu Yang Yi has chosen to play. Uh, D5 at once. Knight to A5, bishop to D3, castles short, rook B1, E6, C4, F5, and then castles short. So a pawn sacrifice. And interestingly enough, uh, Yu Yangi, one of the few classical games he has won, games he has won in this World Cup, was the game against Jan Nepomnish. He went uh, against against the Grunfeld, and mm -hmm. once again it featured some pawn sacrifices. I mean, I believe at some point he has sacrificed two pawns. Yeah, and uh, I think we should uh, remind our viewers that even though we have seen two draws in this match, they weren't without. A, a test, a real test, especially game one, where Yu Yang Yi came up with a novelty on move 15. Maxim was aware of that move, but he had to remember the next 10 moves and play precisely in order to equalize. So Yu Yang Yi did try, he did have an idea, and he's doing the same today with another pawn sacrifice. Yeah, right. And then after castle short, black kind of felt obliged. Yeah, well, now if you look at the position, the knight on a5 is clearly misplaced, right? Uh, white has, uh, well, quite a strong pawn center. So I believe black felt obliged to take the pawns. So f takes e5, bishop e5, knight takes c4 plate, knight goes to f4, knight d6, bishop f3. So that's what we, that's what we ha currently have on a board. Uh, Yuan Gi is still playing pretty quickly, while Maxime's time on the clock is 1 hour 13. According to my database, f5 on move 12 is a novelty. Ah, well. Even the position with c4 only happened in one game, and that was uh, the game of our commentator from the earlier stages of the World Cup, Alexey Armolinsky with the black pieces against Igor Ivanov in 1992, a fresh game. Oh, well. Ah, so, so Alex had it himself. 
this position of the e6. And what was the move he ended up playing? I'm going to check what was uh, Alex's game. It was actually a quick draw after, well, rook b1, castle, bishop d3, e6, c4, b6. Aha, uh -huh, so after c4, black went for b7, b6. And uh, bishop d2, knight c6, a draw was agreed in 13 moves. It was possible back then in 1992 to make a draw in 13 without repetition. Yeah, well, bishop d2 was perhaps imprecise move because it allows black to return the knight into... Funnily enough, uh, the yeah, it's... The only game I see for c4, and before c4... So f5, okay. And yes, f5. Before c4, yeah, well, I don't, I don't think white has any other options after e6. So c4 has to be a move, yeah. c4 has to be a move. Yeah, but if the move d5 itself is very, very rare. Yes. So d5 is already entering a not that known territory. Well, <laughs> saying not that known in the Grunfeld, I think I'm, I should rephrase it. It's not the most popular, but of course very well analyzed, d5. And after d5, knight a5, bishop d3, move 10. There are only three games in the database for that position mm -hmm. with bishop d3. And after c4, there's only one game, um, Alex's game. All right, so after f5 and castles, black went to take the pawn. Knight d6, driving the bishop to f3, and then Maxime takes on d5. I'm curious what, what it's all about. It's like white can, well, technically it's not even a pawn sacrifice, and yeah, and Yu Yang Yi just shows it by taking on d5 with the queen, and he can take the c5 pawn next. Isn't it just better for white? It looks great for white, and uh, he still hasn't spent any time. Yu Yang Yi has gained basically two minutes from the starting one hour, 30 minutes. Yeah. Is Maxime getting out prepared today? in his favorite Grimfeld. Yeah, but then, but then I'm surprised with uh, what he has done himself. I mean, well, getting out, of, out prepared, we could have said so, but he, it was him to play a five. That is the true. The new move, yeah, so. <laughs> to be fair, he played a five. Um, relatively quickly. almost no thinking. Yeah, relatively quickly. He spent some time on castle kingside, that was five minutes. E6 took him six minutes, and then F5 came immediately. Why would he do that to himself unless he is sure of it? So E5, Queen D5, and, it, and I'm not sure what, what black's supposed to do, to be honest. Because, well, at the very least, after a move like knight F7, white can capture the C5 pawn. I'm guessing there might be even better, well, well, not bet, not sure if better, but I mean, <laughs> some other tries as well. But, but what's wrong with queen takes c5? It looks like... Just I'm like a pawn grabber, white I just, would yeah. definitely take that yeah, free I mean, stuff. We, we, yeah, we, we win, well, <laughs> win the pawn back, yeah, right, and then yeah. white uh, arguably is just better developed, better coordinated. This queen on d8 will run into some issues with rook d1 and so on. And, well, the alternative doesn't really save the pawn if you go king h8. Knight on d6 might be running under some pins. Yeah, no, well, surprising. Honestly... It's really surprising. And, yeah, remember we were talking about uh, Maxime, well, being a specialist in the Grunfeld from time to time in those sublines, in those, like, Analyzed but well forgotten lines. See, from time to time, he confuses the, the the opening moves, runs into trouble pretty quickly. And it's very normal, even if he's one of the biggest or the biggest expert of the Grunfeld defense and the Neudorf, both line, both variations are so sharp that if he forgets one tiny detail, he can be worse out of the opening simply because of not remembering a move. It's every time he plays these openings, it's a test, it's an exam. He's, of course, well aware of it, and he must enjoy it, because he still keeps playing these openings, and there's nothing wrong with his openings, of yeah. course. But, yes, one more time, it feels like he may have forgotten something, and that will mean a worse position for the Frenchman. Yeah, but what, what, once again, what surprises me 
F5 Castle. Can you check once again the timing of the F5 and Castle short? How much time Maxim has spent before he went to take this pawn? He took so on only F four F4 yeah. after two minutes of thinking. Two minutes. And then he took on C4 after five seconds of thinking. Yeah, because basically <laughs> when you take on E4, you've yeah. already decided on grabbing the pawn. Played my D6 after 49 seconds of thinking. So quickly, yeah. Yes, all that was pretty forcing in his calculation. And E takes D5 took him three and a half minutes. E takes D5, Queen D5, and now he... No, I mean, what I'm, the argument I'm trying to make, that it's really strange the way it looks. Like, he enters clearly a very, very dangerous position. And kind of not identifying on time the critical point, the turning point. Yeah, it's not easy. Now, it's, now it seems to be, I'm, I'm not claiming that the position is necessarily terribly bad, but it's like, it's too late to think. The position is already defined. It is. Right. And you have your opponent on plus two minutes. He hasn't spent a single second. He still knows what he's doing. You're down 20 minutes. You're just about to lose a pawn. This is not a promising start for the world number six. Um, and those of you who are asking, of course, we're going to focus on the main match, the one for the title between Ding Liren and Timo Rajabo, but that position is way more solid than the one we are looking at right now. And the other thing to stay with, uh, the other argument for staying with this game, that Ding Liren actually didn't play a single move. Yeah, we can Seems, show it quickly yeah, because again, some of you have just joined us and uh, I see you want to know what's going on there. Of course, this is the main game. This is the main court, but this position is not that thrilling at the moment. It happened in yeah. the game between Sergei Karyakin and uh, Ding Liren at the Singfield Cup. So basically that position Ding had a bit more than a month ago against Sergei Karyakin, where AB5 was played once again, and we are repeating. Yeah. Uh, Timur clearly brought a new idea. So, well, swapping Taking the queens on a five. five going knight e4. And now Ding Liren spends his time, it's already 25 minutes thinking in this position. So queen takes f5 is officially a novelty according to my 21. database. Yep. <laughs> Move 21 novelty, we like those novelties. That's Rajabov's improvement in comparison to the Karyakin Ding game, which also saw White getting a quite a pleasant position. So it's Ding Liren who will have to prove that this is a fine position for Black, which normally is the case with the Marshal. They are all very theoretical positions analyzed till the very end. Yeah, right. But but, but he's thinking, he's and it's almost thinking, half yeah. an hour of difference already. Yeah, right. So we'll see how this develops, at least, uh, well, with all those thoughts that I was sharing, that Rebov has to play for a win, but can't really allow himself to lose. There will be no comeback, not enough games, simply. So maybe that's precisely the way one should try, to get, you know, maybe not much, but a playable position and with sort of a risk-free at the same time. Yes, it seems to be a very good practical choice by Timur Rajabov. Now back to the Yuvashir game where our, there, there's actually <laughs> something going on again. Well, queen takes d5, king h8. King h8, yes. So, well, queen takes c5, wins the pawn back. That will be equal material. White having some pressure on black's queen side. But another question is, what if I take that pawn one move later? Like, what's wrong with a developing move like rook d1? And that knight is so awkward. Yeah, rook d1, that's precisely the, the move I was thinking about. I'm actually not sure what black's supposed to do in this case, because, uh, well, you would think... Yeah, I mean, knight is hanging, yeah. And rook d1, well, actually, that's a, that's a very clever move, now that I understand. Because... It just, that's a pin. I'm threatening to win yeah. a piece. <laughs> yeah, no, but the point being that queen c5, black would, or could have considered going to f5 and then later on d4, right, with the knight. And after rook d1, pardon me, but I don't see any other move that knight f7. Then if you go to f7, white takes on c5. That's a huge, huge advantage if I've ever seen one. Taking a pawn... A free yeah. pawn with a tempo, so black has to move his queen away. And also looking at black's development, all the pieces on the back rank and the seventh rank, plus being a pawn down, I'm no, that's really not puzzled. Pawn down, he, he has sacrificed a bit. So oh, that's, sorry. That's, um, that's still I a keep material thinking equal, white's yeah. a pawn down. Apologies. No, but it that's feels fine. like he's a pawn down, but no, he sacrificed the pawn. You're right. Yeah, but. But even then, all even the white then, pieces are developed and active. 
we could just say that maybe the C1 bishop is the worst among the white pieces, but that will also it, soon be activated. Look, it beautifully joins the action in this particular line. Bishop b2, queen f4, queen f8, checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I'm, I'm not sure where, where the queen is going. Where the queen is going? It's like h4 is the only square in, the, yeah. in this line, because queen g5 seemingly loses as well. Well, at least, at least it loses the pawn after trade, knight g6, bishop g5. So why it's just a pawn up and, and b7 is not here for long. So really, I'm not sure what went wrong for Maxime, but it's not a comfortable position to be in. Well, it could be... Ah, Anna, you know, I think I have it. So after rook d1, can it be that he's planning to play bishop f5? Because this would hmm. be a serious improvement. That would be a serious improvement. I yeah. can't take on d6 because the b1 rook yeah, is hanging. Yeah, the b1 rook is hanging. And if and I then, move the rook... Yeah, but not that many squares. It's like you have to put <laughs> in some awkward square like b3. Is that my only square? Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but yes. Yeah, yeah. And how often do you see a rook on a semi-open file? Yeah. It has one possible yeah. move. Oh, well, rook b2 technically is the move because uh, black, black is not, uh, yeah, you, you can't know, take it. not in the position to take. It might, might be not a bad move, like hmm. planning to double, yeah. Rook b2 could be a move. Knight e6, of course, could be a move continuing, you know, complicating things. That might be a very, very sharp line. Because if white really removes the rook to b3, or b b3, by the way, is just terrible, yeah, b2, uh, then black, using the fact that uh, the d1 rook is no longer that well protected, black might have knight e4. Point being, if white takes, black takes back, white can't take on e4. Right, so that's much more comfortable. It, and, and the fact that you develop the bishop with a tempo and protect the queen with two rooks, mm -hmm. so that, that's technically no longer a pin. It might bring us to, to a situation where white actually takes on c5 immediately. Or maybe he considers some other move. Like bishop e3 might be a move as well, because so far black is not in the position to guard the c5 mm -hmm. pawn. There are too many threats. Yeah. And later on it could be that rook from b1 goes to d1 in case of, say, bishop f5. I underestimated bishop f5, not yeah, realizing that well, my rook yeah. can get into a bit of trouble. Me as well. I, I, well, I, for some reason I thought there's no problem with that move. Also, optically, I, I still think that white is a pawn up. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at maths, but all the white pieces are so active. That I felt like we are winning a pawn. No, we are winning back the pawn. But if your pieces are this powerful, this active, and you equalize in terms of material, it means you're, you are better, you yeah, are way should better. Be white. White should be better in this case. So we'll see, but now that we've discovered bishop f5, it no longer looks so bad for Maxime Michel. Yeah, uh, we were really excited about the position for white. It's looking so promising. I still think that uh, Maxime is in a really unpleasant position, but it may not be as bad as it seemed at first glance. Yeah, right, and now... I'm looking a bit further, like in case of knight e6, for instance, that could be yet another idea. Just swap the... Well, it, it feels a bit sad, like to exchange the bishop, which didn't make a single move, yeah? Yeah, but you don't really want to do it if, we if kind you can. Of, you know, kind of ensure that we have a pair of bishops plus rook d1 threats. But another point that I wanted to bring, that sometimes you should be aware of... of such things like rook f3. Yeah. Position exchange sacrifice. Mm, yeah, and then, then perhaps in this very case, black is not on time to organize his piece. Like one, one move is missing. Like if, if b6 would, would be already on the board, then, then uh -huh. black has knight f5 and bring the knight to d4. And in this case, of course, b7 pawn is hanging, so knight f5, rook b7 is far less clear. But ideas as rook take f3 are also in the position. And what's great for Maxim is that finally his opponent started thinking. So officially, Yu Yangi, on move 18, he finally started spending some time. And finally, move made by Ding Li Ren. Let's see. Uh, so we can go back to the finals. 
uh, roughly 25 minutes spent, and he comes up with the move which would take me a couple of seconds in a blitz game. <laughs> <laughs> the bishop is attacked, you go to f8. Just mm. not let him take the bishop. I'm honestly wondering what the alternatives were. It's not, not that I'm saying that black really has to, has to play bishop f8. There could have been other moves, but... So bishop mm. f8, uh, the world number three, Dingley Rand spent 29 minutes 29 on that minutes. move. 29 minutes. Uh, right, uh, I believe his main concern was knight c5. Knight c5 is, of course, the move you are worried about. a6 pawn is under attack. a5 is not really an option, I believe. There is knight b7, even a takes b5 might be problematic. So a5 is not really an option. Rook a8 is, once again, not the move you want to play. So very likely, after knight c5, you end up capturing the knight. So bishop takes, bishop takes, and then playing a move like bishop e6. Well, white has a pair of bishops, but black is very, very solid on those light squares. So um, you're saying that black will have to give up the bishop, white will have the pair of bishops. Well, that's, that's my feeling, yeah, knight c5 played. And he does prefer giving up the dark squared bishop, because after knight e4 he could have also decided to give uh, the light squared bishop for the knight. Yeah, but then I believe, yeah, he, he could have given this bishop, but then it's like d5 is not that stable, mm -hmm. right, the, the knight on d5. So when you're fighting against two bishops with bishop and the knight, you typically want your knight to be very stable in the center, with the, well, so it blocks some diagonal for one of the bishops, it covers the square, squares for the other bishop. So in this regard, I would rather prefer, yeah, knight c5, take on c5, put the bishop on e6. Plus having some ideas of, say, playing knight c7, trying to swap the bishops. Mm -hmm. so this and black doesn't mind that he's got holes on dark squares because the squares are weak, for instance, c5, b6, a5, but uh, it's not easy to make more use of it. You have a very nice bishop on c5, but there isn't more to it. Yeah, well, the weakness of certain, uh, certain color of squares, so dark squares in this case. Well, actually, oh, look I at that yeah, knight b4 a tricky move. Yeah, so uh, I thought just to add a little mm -hmm, bit sure. to the position we yeah. have. So typically, it would involve having a, another pair of knights on the board. So let's mm -hmm. say white gets all the control of the dark squares, and then he gets the knight on d6. Then this is problematic because... In that case, you're busted yeah, for giving like, up the bishop. Yeah, it's like you have, he has the knight on the dark square, which controls the light square, so, so basically he, he controls all the board. But being as it is, black would have, well, actually a decent uh, follow-up with rook e8, you know, and so on. But the move Ding B Ren ends up playing, the move knight d5 to b4, might be even stronger, because now he has the threat of taking on c5 going knight d3. He mm -hmm. can play knight d3 immediately, simplifying if white doesn't, have, doesn't find any, uh, any viable reaction. Or, the, uh, well, another version, once again, white has to skip a, skip a move for that. But Rajabov had it all in mind rook and goes rook e5 five immediately. Quickly. Yeah. 131, rook to e5. What does that mean? Those guys He's are playing still very out fast. His moves. Move 24, and Rajabov hasn't spent any time. He's got more time than at the beginning of the game. This is move 24. Yeah, right, but is he getting anywhere? That would be my question, because now after rook e5, isn't it bishop c2, which is like equalizing on a spot, or do I miss something? Point being, if white captures on b4, Black first takes on c5, and after, well, I don't know, bishop, bishop takes c5, you have to play, and then bishop b3, and those are, it's like opposite colored bishops on the board, but similarly with zero chance for white to fight for an advantage. Black is rock solid, just pulls the bishop on d5, and the game's over. Uh, so, I'm wondering if there is anything wrong with bishop c2.
Bishop's to certainly yeah. seems the most logical to simplify the position. Yeah, so you, you want to take on c5, then take on b3. How on earth white, is, white avoids that? And that would be opposite colored bishops. Yeah, well, seemingly almost by force. Because I mean, white can't really take on c2, that will mean knight c2, yeah, knight c2 then knight d4. Knight goes, uh, well, knight takes on d4. Then, at the very least, once again, black takes on, on d4, takes on c5, gets rook endgame. Let's just show it on the board, so yeah. everything would be traded after but rook d1. Yeah, say so rook d1, knight takes, I suppose. Yeah, the knight has to, otherwise it's not coming out of c2. So, what white's supposed to take with? Could be... Well, I'm not sure, it could be the say rook takes yeah and then still let's try to swap literally everything with black just like we are playing for a draw let's say we know two draws and we win the match so takes 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 on d4 ba4 it's unlikely that something bad happens yeah so white has technically has d5 but black is just in time with the king then king runs to e7 nothing really yeah, the pawn will be taken back after the king arrives in d6, so that's a draw. Yeah, very likely a draw. So bishop c2 any, seems to be Any alternative an after bishop c2 for white? Mm, not sure, really. So takes... Again, I'm, I'm, I'm checking this one. Takes... Uh, check on f7. Ah, maybe, maybe that's the point. Check on f7 first. King f7, and then take on c5. And claim that you have e pressure. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know how serious this will be, but at, at least, like, black will have difficulties getting anywhere on the queen side. Well, uh, white has the majority on the king side. So that at least can be considered as the way to continue the game for white. Maybe that's the, that's the reasoning be, behind Rojabo's rook e5. Because, well, I don't really believe that it's so dangerous for black, but at least it's something. It will still maintain the pressure, you're right. That is a uh, way of going for opposite color bishops, but white's bishop is more active, plus the rook on the seventh, of course, mm, yeah, is a kind of great factor. And balancing the situation a bit, yeah. So once again, it's bishop to c5, yeah, the problem that after bishop b3, knight b3, knight guards the bishop, so white simply uh, wins a piece. Therefore, I have to take on c5, yes, bishop f7, king f7, bishop takes, I suspect it has to be ba4, and then, yeah, check on e7, bring the other rook, well, white can, white can try. Yes, and this is what Dingliran should evaluate, whether this position is any dangerous, with white having pressure but is that pressure enough to to build on or he will manage to to hold this quite comfortably this is what he must be evaluating and if not bishop c2 what other what other moves can come into mind bishop c2 is the most forcing and it would be great for black if it simplifies the position to an, to an extent where he has no risk of losing but here there is a slight risk still because of the active white pieces so that's something to evaluate for sure for Dingli Ren uh, whether he will be okay defending this endgame or not uh, well let's see just a quick reminder on the format because I see a couple of questions in the chat so in the finals we see Dingli Ren with one point lead yesterday he won a brilliant game against Timur Rajabov and that means that uh, yeah there are two more classical games today and tomorrow but if Ding Liren wins today he wins the match so it's the best of four he can win the match today if he wins the game if it's a draw obviously the game will be played tomorrow and Rajabov if he ties the score out of the four classical games then we will see tie breaks on Friday for the other match, they are playing for the third place, and it's a tie so far. So if they keep drawing, same situation, we will have tie breaks on Friday. They are playing for the third place, which may be a potential wild card for the candidates tournament for next year. So now, another, uh, now that I'm looking at this position, 
and trying to find an alternative for the English Uh Well, I do get the feeling that Bishop C2 will be the move he will end up playing. Because, you know, any other moves with the bishop, and since the bishop on f5 is attacked, it's like fir your first instinct, yeah, move the bishop. Well, it could be the g6, but once again, feels strange to, to play such move. Uh, any other move with the bishop, like bishop g6 runs into h5, then say the same question, where to put the bishop. Bishop h7 seemingly allows this move. I'm not 100% sure, but... So the idea point being that being, if yes, take it takes a check on e6, king h8, white captures the rook on c8. Now if black recaptures the bishop on c8, the knight on b4 is hanging. Could be knight c2 intermediate. Mm. Oh, that's a weird position once again. It's a really, really weird position here. So now the rook is hanging, the bishop is yeah. hanging, and you have saved the knight because the point was that black couldn't take on c8, then we can capture the knight on b4. Yeah, the well whole here. idea of knight b4 is that the bishop is always hanging on d4. Right, but after knight c2, yeah, it seems it, it, it works for black. So that being said, black actually can move the bishop somewhere else, not necessarily on c2. Interesting moment uh, for Ding Liren and what decision will he go for? And in the other game, do we have any updates? Not really. Yu Yan Yi is thinking and he almost equaled on the clock with Maxime Michelle Graf. No move after King H8, which kind of gives us an idea that our conclusion of White having a comfortable position and no problem and so on might have been too hasty. And in fact, the position is much harder to assess than it looked like. So Yu Yang Yi still hasn't made a move. He blitzed out his first 17 moves and now he has been thinking for about 20 minutes by now. Yep. So anyway, this position promises a lot more in terms of fighting for an advantage and so on and so on. Because in Rajabov's game, still, I believe, black has to have some way to simplify the, to simplify the, the game and uh, hold the position. Yeah, I'm really curious what will happen in both games in this moment. It's a critical moment in both matches. And I'd like to throw this question to you guys here on Twitch and YouTube. We, of course, monitor the chat as usual. Let us know what do you think about today's openings. Who has out-prepared who? Do you think that we will see really exciting games today? Will there be a quick draw? What is your feeling? Will there be a simplification in the Ding game? Or will, will Rajabo manage to keep the pressure and have a chance to tie the score? What do you think about that match? And how do you see the game between Yu Yangi and Maxim Vashelagrov? Let us know in the chat. Yeah, right. I'm curious to know what Chad thinks of, of Rajabov's game, to be honest, because, uh, well, the more we looked, the more we thought that, well, this has to be a harmless attempt, so black has to be fine. But Rajabov being on 1 hour 31, this should be a worrisome fact for Ding Li Ren, right? So, well, he certainly doesn't know exactly how to play this position, started to spend time after Bishop F8. Well, perhaps already making his calculation about knight c5, knight b4 line. Now it, mm -hmm. it at least gets explained, because as I said, I would play bishop f8 after a couple of seconds, my yeah. bishop is attacked with the knight, I love my bishops, I go back, but then in another five seconds I would take on c5, not even <laughs> considering the other moves. The so Ding Liren once again spent 29 minutes playing bishop f8, but it's for what Yevgeny explained. He already calculated knight, knight b4, b4 and the rest of the mess. Yes, yeah, so knight b4 of course is uh, the most principled attempt yeah, to not to give your opponent any kind of advantage. While it possibly would have, yeah, I mean, bishop c5 wouldn't be a disaster, but you don't necessarily want to play, to, get, mm -hmm. to give your opponent two bishops to play somewhat inferior position. And that before, of course, is more principled, just trying to, you know, equalize and just make a drop. But after rook e5, he starts to think yet again. And this could mm -hmm. be that, well, 
Maybe he missed the move. Maybe he's not certain about this bishop c2 and the, this very line with, with the opposite colored bishop. So once again, bishop c2, could it be that there is like a simple tactic that I'm missing? But that seemingly is always the case. But no, it in seemed very reasonable, everything that you have showed here. Mm. Bishop c2 and... Uh, yeah, well, I don't, I don't see any other move for white here, right? Mm. The feeling is... White can't really do anything but take on b4, take on f7. Yeah, I'm looking for a moment, honestly, I'm looking for a moment to take on, to take on b5. Let's say if we agree that after a b5, black recaptures a b5. Oh, speaking of looking for a moment to take on b5, couldn't he take on b5 here? Because if black recaptures a b5, white goes rook e5, it might be, you know, kind of another situation so black doesn't play bishop c2. But if he does, then I believe this position is actually very bad for black. Because not only white is a pawn up, but also the other rook is threatening to. And to, well, it's basically a free pawn. And even if black gets to take the pawn on b2 somehow by some miracle, getting there with the rook, it doesn't, it doesn't have any impact, right? So those c6, b5 pawn against the b4 pawn, basically. You have a point here, and also every time we look at opposite colored bishop endgames, it would only be drawish if there were no rooks on the board. So with, with both rooks on the board, this is still really unpleasant. Plus the uh, bishop of white, the dark squared bishop, is more powerful than the c2 bishop, wherever you put it. Well, on d5 I would prefer, not on c2, but still. This could have been an interesting alternative. Rajabov didn't play it. He went rook e5 instead of taking on b5. It's not exactly that forcing the line, but uh, right. it could have been a try. Uh, well, okay. And Dean ends up playing g7, g6, which, as I said, does seem to be somewhat awkward move, but if you ask me to provide the exact <laughs> reason why, the answer would be I don't know. Just that it, it feels a bit, bit awkward, but I don't know, really. Is, is there any way to refute it? Not sure. Before we go into the chess details, let me just read out some of the comments on YouTube and Twitch since we, got, we asked you guys about your thoughts. And I see some of you are already calling Dinga champion. Others are very sure that Tamer will make a comeback today. It's great to see that we have, we have fans for both sides and also in the other game, whether it's um, Maxime who is in trouble or Yu Yang Yi. Well, he, he came up with an interesting idea about Maxime still knows what he's doing or he found it at the board. There are all sorts of different thoughts. I also like the suggestion I think it was Sago 3 who said that Rajabov and Maxim are playing a friendly game in backstage. That's another possibility. So many interesting thoughts in the chat. Keep them coming, both on YouTube and Twitch. We so appreciate that you are here and that you let us know about your comments. On the World Cup, this is the finals for the first place, Ding Liren and Rajabov. And for the third place, Yu Yang Yi and Maxim Vasilagrov. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what happens to Yu Yang Yi. He, he didn't move ever since King H8, which was maybe 40 minutes ago already. Oh, let me see well, how I mean, much time he's spent. Really, really, let me see that. Really, really long time spent after King H8. Uh, he so has been thinking for 27 minutes. 27 minutes. Yi. Time is passing so slow when he's not making a move. <laughs> That's why I prefer rapid chess. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I prefer rapid chess. <laughs> All right, so what happens after g6? Rajab is back to the board, and this could be the first time he's surprised. And then, even though the position is not that sharp, the queens are off, yeah, some potential trades, third on, but still, this, well, when you are a dingly ran spot, it could be twofold thinking. I mean, thanks God. I made him think, so he's no longer in the book. Or, oh my god, he's thinking, that means I made a bad move. Because <laughs> yeah. otherwise, he would be prepared, if it's one of the engine moves, if, if it's a good move, he would be prepared, he would play quickly. Very true. Um, we n we'll need to see what the full picture is, but so far, at least, it means that Tim Rajab will also start spending some... No, no, he's not spending time, AB5. actually. <laughs> Just the moment I was claiming to finally get to see him thinking. You know what? AB5, AB5, rook to A7. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's a dangerous. lot of pressure. That's dangerous. Attacking F7, and, and in this particular case, I'm not sure what Black's supposed to do. It's like you have to go back to D5, it seems. Because it's like, it, is the checkmate what's threatening? Bishop F7 moved the rook with this covered check. That, yeah, who said you can't, play, you can't play for mates in end games? Yeah, and then, then if you go back to D5, it's just... Well, I'm not sure how bad it is, but it's supposed to be bad. It's like basically in a, well, tempo-ish position, but still where white has some initiative, you're defending, and then you spend two moves going knight before and back. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. So AB5, what are the alternatives there? He can try, he can try capturing on C5 one of those moments, but I'm not a big fan of that. So taking back with the C pawn to keep the A5 open is also not appealing because you leave the A6 pawn on the board and it can, for instance, be taken yeah, right, right now. It seems like it, it can be taken Although after there's rook A8, uh, white captures the here. That, that'd, be, that'd be a very strange situation. So takes over here. Yeah, right, he can't, can't take with the knight because the knight on A6, the white knight on A6 is pinned. There is no way to protect the knight on a6, so you kind of have to take over there. Rook takes d4, and I suspect rook takes b5. Well, white is a pawn up, or two pawns up, rather, but mm -hmm. he, all of his pieces are so awkward, so... He still is yet to find a way to untie the Yeah, like, like some moves knight. like that. Oh, well, actually, well, rook a5, rook, or, no. or b6. Can I play rook b6? Point being that... You just want to push b5? That, that's, yeah, if, if you're not capturing any of those, I'm, I'm pushing b5. If you do capture, however, that's takes, takes, and then some unpleasant use, uh, news, rook g6 first. So using the pin on the f7 pawn, rook g6 first with a check, and then take the bishop. In this case, white, in fact, is practically winning. It's already an almost 40-minute time advantage for Timur Rajabov, who is here to try to tie the score. I think his intentions are now clear. We were a little bit worried about his opening choice because he is repeating their game one, which was a solid draw. But he did have an improvement also in comparison to the Karyakian Ding game that was a draw at the Sinkfield Cup this August. Mm -hmm. So he came up, he came to the board with an opening idea where he can put pressure on Ding Liren and the time management shows that he is being successful in, in that uh, pressure that he has created and even though Ding Liren is leading one point in the match today he is the one to struggle yeah and once again the natural recapture which Ding Liren might, might end up playing looks very very dangerous after rook a7 so that black is forced to go knight d5 and now the question is if white can develop his pressure further right well but you know, even like say takes on d5, rook takes, rook takes, pawn takes, and then play b2, b4 would lead to a very similar situation that Karyakin had against uh, Ding Liren. And this position is also very unpleasant for black, in fact, because the pawns are weak, and bishop c5, b c5, very important, is not yet. A draw, despite yeah, the optical bishop. He has taken with the C pawn. He has taken with the C pawn. Okay. So knight a6, that's what we expect. Yes, so C takes b5 once again is a, a very straightforward move that either will lead to the collapse of the black queen side or, but precise calculation, Ding Liren has proved to himself that he'll be fine. Ah, uh, well, look, that's a. That's a square on c6 after that. So after knight a6, we cut... Or oh, rather, I got distracted, by the way, by the rook a8 move, like pinning the, pinning the knight. But it could be knight c6 back. Maybe that's the whole point of Ding Liran's play. Attacking the rook on e5, attacking the bishop on d4, and then, you know, sacrificing the exchange on f5 is not yet that appealing. Moving the rook back, black simply captures on d4, if you take on b5 still, knight d4, pawn takes, rook takes, pawn up for white, but 
the pieces are somewhat discoordinated. I, I do believe in Black's position in this case. It would be a pawn down for Black, but the pair of bishops and very active pieces, I also agree that it would give enough compensation, and White will still need to find a way back for that knight from a6. It doesn't have a square at the moment except for b8. I Lovely. <laughs> Lo yeah, well, sometimes <laughs> like you b8. <laughs> yeah, right. Rajavov has knight it calculated. To, knight to e6, Look at this me. game. It's What's on fire. On? What has just happened? What's going on? What's, what's about knight e6? And once again, played pretty quickly. Rajavo has spent three minutes to achieve a position that is, <laughs> well, it's moved 26. It started out with a very theoretical marshal that could have led to a solid draw. Instead, the board is on fire in an endgame. Let's just try to figure out this 96 mm -hmm. move. I don't understand it. Okay. So, first and foremost, black is supposed to take. It's, it's too much stuff hanging. Yeah, the rook on d8. Uh, any kind of counterattacks? Not really, because takes on d8, attacks f7 as well. And even if all those trades happen, white has rook takes a6 in the end. So, knight e6 has to be taken. So, if it is taken. I suspect with the bishop, because pawn takes runs into rook f5. You've got to take with the g pawn. Bishop e6. And we shouldn't be looking any further because mm, this leads to more or less the same position after king h7, but in the other line, the pawn was on f5, so pawn is possible to take with a check and then return back to e6 and, and then, then the do what, what, whatever mm. you were planning to do. So basically, by in this moment after knight e6, by taking with the bishop, black preserves one extra pawn for himself. So rook takes, pawn takes, bishop takes on e6, king to h7, and here bishop takes c2. This is, as far as I understand, that's what is planned. But then again, the question is, what happens after this knight c2 move? I don't quite understand. So that's an intermediate move to make the knight not be hanging on before, which was the key in every single tactical variation for white. Yeah, I don't understand what's going on. Isn't he just, like, lost? No? But wait, you can place the rook on c1, so I'll be defending my bishop on c8 ah, when well, you take on d4. Brilliant. This, but then knight takes, pawn takes. Ah, you're right, and in fact it could be an unpleasant position all of a sudden, because... Uh, well, let's for, for a second imagine that everything is traded, like, like D, white's D4 and B2 is traded for black's A6 and B5, which is not such a best scenario for black, because, let's say, in this line, there might be extra pair of pawns remaining on a queen side, which basically favors the, the attacking side, the side which has an advantage. And then the fact that this pawn is on g6, the other is on h6, the g6 pawn is really weak. g6 pawn is really weak. And I can imagine something like that, say white goes b3, puts the bishop on c4, to be a very, very unpleasant position for black to play. I mean, it might be holdable, but it's a pawn down with rooks on the board. And the white bishop being more active than the black bishop, this is... Uh, a really good chance for Timur Rajabo. What a move, knight to e6. Play with almost no thinking. Rajabo is on <laughs> move 26. An hour and 27 on the clock. Hanging pieces everywhere. And Dingley Ren is yet to make a move at 45 minutes. So, y mm -hmm. so you know, Anna, I think all, all, all those moves, yeah, bishop e6 taken, so this has to happen. So. Rook takes e6, and we'll reach the position that I have on my analysis diagram. And then, black will have to decide, because knight c2 is not the only move. Black can try to play various positions like that. Takes on c8, say white captures on b4, and possibly some moves there. Like say, I can imagine black having... Ah, well, maybe that's the, gear, that's the move which saves black. I'm, I'm not yet sure, but it could be. Kind of trying to simplify, get it to a rook endgame with, uh, 
maybe a pawn down, with, but with an active rook, like say in this line, bishop c3, takes, this one isn't even a pawn down, right? This one isn't even a pawn down. So we'll see. Yeah, the simplifications happen. Rook e6, f takes. I believe Rajabov has to take on e6. Let's have a look at it one more time. So bishop takes e6. Bishop takes e6. And this variation is better than the other one you have when you showed where the pawn would have been hanging on f5 with a check. So better to keep the pawn on g6. Yeah, so bishop b6, king h7. White has no other choice but to capture the rook. And then my latest version was just to take, just to recapture the bishop on c8. So white takes over there, and then white desperately needs a strong move after rook c4, because otherwise I believe black just holds it. So a critical moment after bishop takes c8. Move 29, by the way, so... <laughs> yeah, casual move 29, an hour and 27 minutes for Timur Rajabov. How yeah. quickly do you think Ding Liran will make his move? Do you think he has it all mm, calculated? I'm not sure yet, because that, that one is really a turning point, right? Both knight c2 or rook takes uh, c8 being attractive moves, or rather possible moves. Yeah, so once again this, and rook to c4. Does look like a decent chance. And Dingleran will take his time. So this is indeed pressure on the world number three, who won a really nice game yesterday, but Rajabov managed to find a variation for today's game that was uh, not an opening novelty that would be winning, but queen takes f5 on move 21. That was where he deviated from yep. the Karyakin Ding game from the Sinkfield Cup, and it gave him a really good practical chance because it was a slight pressure from that moment on and Dingleran is now under time pressure and also the position is not pleasant. Yeah, but it could be once again as we have already seen for the few times that Dingleran facing the opening surprise he spends his time and then he comes up with the solution like finding it over the board which is nowadays even more impressive than good computer preparation from home. Right, so you're basically you're proving Mm, your ability of playing on par with the engine, like ma make fighting against the computer home preparation from the other guy and still not losing and even sometimes winning the game. Yeah, to be fair, I wouldn't be surprised because that's what happened to Dingleran in so many games. I'm recalling now his game against uh, his compatriot Yu Yang Yi, the game that he won, and it was Yu Yang Yi's preparation and exchange sacrifice a really complicated position. <laughs> Dingleran basically just figured out all the best moves by the engine and it was such a mess and unclear position with many tactical motives. And he, he calculated them all, he saw it all. That's why he's the world number three and one of the potential challengers for the world championship throne. Many of you guys are saying that Dingleran is the one who's gonna challenge Magnus Carlsen. A very promising career, and I actually wouldn't be surprised if he gets to challenge Magnus soon. Yeah, right. Well, he does seem to be one of the, the favourites in the candidates, right? <laughs> I mean, with such a play, with such a result in latest tournaments. Uh, well, and we can finally switch to the other game, because there, there, there were a few more moves played. So far less simplified and far less obvious who is better prepared and who is more ready, so to speak, uh, to play this position. So once again, uh, game number three for, well, in the third place playoff between Yu Yang Yi and Maxime Vichero Graf. So we were questioning Maxime's position over there. Uh, it was him to play a novelty on move 12 when he went f5 and in a very rare line already. So d5 was the rare move and then f5 Unexplored territory starting from MIV-12, basically. Uh, what right. a difference between the two games today in terms of like, where is it that theory ends? So in the Yu Yang Yi game, it was a novelty on move 12, F5. And in the Rajab of Ding Liren game, they deviated from Ding Liren's own game against Sergei Koyakin on move 21. 
So queen takes c5 was played, bishop to f5, and then bishop b2, which is a clever move, because on bishop b1, bishop takes g7, followed by knight e6, simply wins for white, which, by the way, brings me back to this, to our variation with rook to d1, and in case of bishop f5, play bishop b2 nevertheless, <laughs> right? So, so well, we, we completely miss, or rather I completely miss this, this idea that the rook cannot be taken because of check on g7, knight e6. Bishop b2 is a really nice move, and yeah. we didn't consider that. So what happened in the game? Maxim has taken, and seemingly not spending too much time. He has taken, and he went queen, uh, queen f6 with the tempo, attacking the b2 rook. There might be some issues on, on, on this f4 knight, like black playing bishop e4 at some point. Like uh, After rook d2, my question would be, like after rook d2, does black have a comfortable move? Well, knight e4 is also possible. Yeah, right. So, so then, then rook d2 is just not a great idea because black can actually play knight I was trying knight to e4, figure out right? what's the brilliant move after knight e4. But there isn't any. Okay. <laughs> there isn't any. No, no. It's just like takes, takes, and, and that's it, right? So white apparently is not worse just yet. I mean, he puts the knight on d5 and possibly even trades the queens, but black has little fears in this position. So it could be that, after all, the line worked out for Maximus Schiello-Grauf. It seemed dangerous after the opening, we keep referring to the moment that it was Maxime's novelty on move 12, but then he started thinking a um, couple of moves later, he was already half an hour behind on the clock. So it's not that kind of novelty that we would like to make, that you make a novelty yeah. and then you end up spending way more time than your opponent. Uh, right, and rook b2 to e2 was played, well, precisely for that reason, to stop... Uh, appearance of one of the black pieces on e4 so to control the e4 square. But then black seemingly has time to play a move like rook e8 or even b7, b6 to start with, chasing the queen away, then playing rook e8. So seemingly there has, be a, uh, has to be a solution for black in terms of equalizing. Still, as long as the queens are, are on the board, it's somewhat more pleasant position for white in terms of the pawn structure. So three versus two on the king side, king is somewhat safer. Mm -hmm. Well, with situation being as it is, it's not that black king runs into any, any kind of troubles right now. Yeah? So. And Yu Yang, he seems to be really interested in his compatriots game. More than in his own one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he's focused on his own, but uh, it gets very lonely in the playing hall. A reminder that this event started with 128 players. And since it's a knockout system, we only have four of the very best in the world who managed to stand the test and make it to the finals. That is, we have Ding Liren versus Tamar Rajabo for the first place and Yu Yangi versus Maxim Versagra for the third place. Both Ding Liren and Timur Javov have qualified already to the Candidates Tournament, and the third place here may mean a potential wild card to the Candidates too. It's a possibility, it's not guaranteed. The third place here, the third place at the Grand Prix, and the second place at the Grand Swiss. You know what, um, upon closer inspection, I do understand that it's not that comfortable for black in terms of protection those queen side pawns because i thought b6 queen goes away and then rook e8 but queen doesn't go away it goes to c7 it makes it so awkward for black it's like the rook on 8 is now hanging then a7 pawn is hanging if you move the rook so well it's still somewhat unpleasant situation for maxim well particularly the knight being on d6 it's kind of not very comfortable. Therefore, in fact, yeah, white played rookie two to prevent this knight from going to e4. Well, it still could be somewhat more pleasant for white. Because the move I've suggested, rookie eight, will simply 
surrenders a pawn on a7. I don't know if white has to trade on e8 or, or can capture a7 pawn immediately. So it doesn't seem to be a move. And then, and what's the move then? It's like you, you really have to do something awkward. Well, you can try to simplify by going bishop e4. So that when white captures, black captures mm, the knight in return. But in the open position, bishop's better than the knight. Still, the knight on d6 is not that stable. So that the only purpose, it, well, the only thing it achieves is you, you swapped the, the bishop from f5 uh, for a white's knight, but it doesn't really help solving the issue with those uh, queenside pawns. It might still be that it, it's not such a pleasant position for Maxime Michel Graf. And still no move from Ding Li Ren once again. It's thinking time in both matches and that gives us time to talk to you guys more in the chat, both on Twitch and YouTube. What do you think about the recent moves and how it changed your evaluation of what you thought earlier when, it, when we asked you guys about your prediction, what's going to happen in the Ding Rajabov game, what's going to happen in the Yu Vashir game. How do you see it now after a couple of new moves? Do you think it's still going to be what you have predicted earlier? Or did your mind change about uh, the possible outcome of the games? Now, I can give you one evaluation. The final match will not finish today. Rajabov is not going to will lose. Not have a result not today. going to lose in this, in this position. I agree with you. I think that's that's a pretty safe bet that uh, Ding Li Ren will not win the match today unless Rajabo blunders something huge. But it doesn't seem like he is in any trouble in terms of what could have been difficult for Rajabo is if he comes to this game feeling like he's defeated. Because psychologically, to come back from a defeat, knowing that you only have two more games and you're playing the world number three who barely ever loses games. So... Coming from that perspective that he had to build himself up and still believe that he has a chance, he has a shot, I think he has done that. I think he's proving yeah. that he believes in himself enough. And, yeah, well, especially, you know what, uh, in a way, so I'll, I'll bring the position back there. In a way, his sort of modest approach to go for the position which will be safe but maybe not the sharpest one and, and you don't have, like, too much of a, of a game if Black knows everything. It actually shows his confidence because precisely in the situation as, he, as, he, as you've described, if he, would be, if he would give up, then still, you know, the chess society, the, the logic of the knockout match, it kind of pushes you that you have to play for a win at any cost. And then what we see, you know, like King's Gambit, disaster after 15 moves, when then you're begging for a draw. <laughs> basically surrendering the match said no he's playing well also implifying that if i don't win now then the final fight will be tomorrow i can play for a win with the black pieces at, le at least try to play for one still no new new moves we are waiting for maxime to make a decision here on a move uh, yeah, back to, back to the, the 20, 20 something, 21. One. 21. I thought they made it uh, to somewhat a more advanced stage, but no, it, it is still only move 21, the time control being an hour and 30 minutes for the first 40 moves, and from move 41 on, it's an additional half an hour, and a 30 second increment from move 1 on. Uh, well, and once again, so this position... I won't say it's clarified completely, but it, typically it's not the position where you are getting into a time trouble in, right? So having, well, both players having them on just below one hour probably suggests that there won't be a big time trouble action, right? But now Maxime has to solve the issues which are on the board, not on the clock. Question in the Twitch chat, if the FIDE World Cup is different to the World Championship. Yes, it is different, but it is part of the World Championship cycle. It's not that simple how the candidates uh, 
is built up. So the yeah. candidates tournament, the winner of the candidates tournament will be the challenger of Magnus Carlsen. That's the event that Fabiano Caruana won and that's how he challenged Magnus Carlsen in London last November. Now, to qualify to the candidates tournament, that's where we have events like this one, the World Cup. Yes, it's a by name, it's a world yep. title event, but you don't become the world champion by winning the World Cup. You do qualify to the candidates by finishing on the top two spots in the World Cup. So there is, of course, a very nice prize fund here at the World Cup. They are playing for the prize money. The, the winner of the tournament will receive $110,000. There's in total a million and six hundred thousand dollars on the line. So from the prize fund to the qualification spots, first two uh, spots go to the candidates. Uh, this is what they are mainly playing for, but they don't become world champions by winning here. Yeah, right. Well, the, the same. Well, the tournament under the same format used to be called the World Championship in those, like... That is true. Yeah. There used to be two different World Championships, two different the Classical versions, yeah. and uh, the FIDE World Championship. And some of the earlier World Champions, they did become World Champions by winning the knockout system. You're right, Yevgeny. Such as Rustam Kasimjanov. That was Alexander Halifman, Rustam Kasimjanov, Ruslan Ponomaryev, mm -hmm. yeah, who are... Well, those were the only three? Oh, Vishy Anand won one of those world championships. And uh, then he won the overall as well. Yeah, well, so seemingly, yeah, like, look at the, at the playing hole. So both guys with the black pieces feel a bit uncomfortable, it seems. And once again, no move from Dingley Rand for quite a while. So I suggest that we go back there. Dingley Rand's time is down to 30 minutes, almost an hour difference between Table Rajabov's and Dingley Rand's clock. Truth being told, it's mil 29. So if we don't pay attention to how much time Rajabov has, it's absolutely fine. I mean, mil 29, you still have half an hour. And you are thinking, what of those two possible endgames to, to pick for Black? Yeah, it is still big brain time here. And one name we forgot to mention was Veselin Topalov for the FIDE World Champion title. And then the system got back into the normal, uh, normal route by uniting the two different world championship systems, and that's when Vladimir Kramnik beat Vasilin Topalov and became the overall world champion. So we have one game on the video feed and the other one on the analysis board. In both of them, Black's the move, and in both of them, they've haven't been a move for quite a while. So once again, Dingley Rand's options are, oh well, and finally he has played Rook C8, the move that I kind of thought should be, should be preferred by Black. So options were, no longer exist, but options were Knight C2, which would lead, after you've spotted this Rook C1, which would lead to the opposite colored bishops. Well, Black technically could still take on C8, and it'd be the same uh, colored bishops at the pawn down for black, but the opposite colored bishop's position would be knight takes, pawn takes, and then one of the possible moves, like rook takes d4 or a6, a5. But what Ding B. Ren played was rook takes c8, c3 takes b4, and then this rook c4 move that I was looking at. Black um, is a pawn down, but he's hoping to take on b4 and even after the a6 pawn will be lost, he's basically basing his uh, hopes on that with a pawn down too, he can defend if it's a rook end game, for yeah, instance. Yeah, well, it's very important to try to swap the bishops for black. It's like in case of bishop c3, there is bishop takes b4. In case of bishop e5, I suspect black might want to try bishop g7. Because if this happens, rook a6, rook takes b4, White's only option to guard the b-pawn would be rook a2, and the rook on a2 is miserable. And then, just go g5, go g4, I believe it's just a draw. 
Yeah, that would be, of course, a very good drawing chance. Uh, we could claim it's a draw because it's a pawn up for white, but in rook and games, the activity of the rook is the most important factor. So now, the pressure, in fact, is on Rajabov in terms of finding the playable version of it. Right, mm -hmm. so he has, I believe, quite a few possibilities to get uh, the position up a pawn. But which one to prefer, that's the question. So you can try, but no, well, bishop c3 doesn't seem to work at all. Yeah, bishop takes. Once again, you have to trade. No, no, that's... So not bishop c3, seemingly not bishop e5. Bishop e3, not really. See, I don't know what he has to do. Don't see it. Bishop e3, black can take on b4. And can take on b2. And after rook a7 check, there is kind of a sequence of only moves, which is king g8 and king to f7, but it's so logical. You want, your opponent has the dark square bishop, so you want to move your king on light square, so it's, it's not like impossible to find those two moves. And then black is just fine, and, and in this very case might be even better, because he's the side who has the passed pawn. And the detail that's been pointed out in the chat, and very true that they have also made it to move 30. Uh, move 30 means that you can offer a draw, but I don't think we're going to see a draw offer. <laughs> no, no, not here. Not, not just yet. It could, be, it could be a situation where Rajabov gives up his hopes and offers a draw, but I mean, if, once again, if they get to this position that I was uh, thinking about, yeah? It's like, if you have this position on the board, rook b4, you have to play rook a2, then black plays say, a few more moves, I don't know, h5, if it's clever or not, so it takes, takes, king g2, rook b3, something like this, and then you hover around here and there, and then you say, no, I can't win. And then you offer a draw to your opponent. This can happen. Yes, but you but will only offer a draw when you have tried everything, and then yeah, it's, it's like, clear, okay, yeah. I did all I could. So if anyone will offer a draw ever in this game, that's going to be Tamer or Jabov after trying every single possibility in the yeah. position. And from Ding Liren's standpoint, it doesn't make sense to offer a draw because he's oh no, a pawn he's down defending. and he's leading in the match. So it's clear his opponent won't accept a draw until he tried everything possible. And that would also be disrespectful if... You, and in general, at any level, it is considered disrespectful if you're in a worse position and you offer a draw, unless there's like a huge rating difference. I've seen that at a couple of open tournaments, especially if a titled player gets into trouble against a lower rated opponent, and then, that's you know, that's another move. Like you are, I offer a draw because I'm higher rated, I'm in a worse position, but I don't want to lose the game, so I'm playing the card that, hey, I'm a, the better player, supposed to be better player. Yeah, right. That, and, and you know, and sometimes it's the other way around. So a lower rate player, and I've been in, the, in such situations quite a bit, so a lower rate player against you, uh, well, he gets a promising position and he offers a draw. And that's once again, in, in those open tournaments, that's a tough spot because you're supposed to win like nearly all of your games against uh, so-called amateurs because you're fighting for high prices and this and that. But then you understand the position is bad. And, well, when the guy offers a draw, it's just that he's, he knows what he's doing. So he's trying to provoke you. He doesn't want this draw, in fact. He wants to provoke you to, to react in a more aggressive way in a bad position. So, so you will end up losing. Yeah, the psychological part of offering and declining a draw. That if you decline the draw, you need to prove what you have. Yeah, precisely. Okay, so now Rajabo will need to prove what he has, even though he wasn't offered a draw, but... And he yeah, will not well, be offered a draw. There's yeah. no risk that Ding Liren would ever offer a draw. Yeah, but seemingly Ding Liren has found the way, uh, has found his way out of trouble, as it stands for now. So Rajabo will have to, uh, well, have to demonstrate what does he have in this position. Ah, uh, well, there is Bishop F6, though. It could be still tricky, you know. Now that I'm looking at it, there is bishop f6. And why it is different from bishop e5. 
So that was the line we were looking at. Bishop e5, bishop g7, and then I was swapping the bishops, even though white does have an alternative. So white's alternative is bishop d6, guarding the b4 pawn, planning to take on a6, but in this case, black has rook c6, the bishop attacked, the pawn defended, and then next move taking on b2. But now that I come to realization that bishop f6 is actually different, because now if black does that, white goes bishop e7, attacks the pawn, and who knows what black has to do. Because this position with the, the extra pair of pieces with the bishops present might not be that comfortable. I'm not really claiming that it's that's simply bad. Black still has chances. Like go on bishop c3, trying to eliminate. So first and foremost, you want to get rid of those queenside pawns. So three versus two, very likely a draw. It's an unpleasant position, but with rooks and bishops, with bishops only, with rooks only, yeah, it's very likely a draw. Unless it's a pawn end game, which is, I mean, you pawn down, you're lost. <laughs> you're I mean, that's, that's, yeah, well, good luck looking for, searching for exceptions. They do exist, but basically, you never tried, uh, you never trade the last pair of pieces, I mean, in such situation. Yeah, but as long as there are those pawns on the B file on the board, that's kind of an additional object for white to attack, so combining his advantage on the king side with extra threats to the B5 pawn. So this position would actually be quite unpleasant. So it might be that Rajabov still has some, uh, well, some last push, so to speak. In terms of the time management, what a difference already. Uh, 50 minutes between Tamer Rajabov and Dingeren's uh, time situation. What's good for Dingeren is that they are on move 30, so only 10 more moves need to be played, and Dingeren will get an extra half an hour. And the position has simplified a, a great extent from what we saw where the novelty was on move 21. Queen takes f5 is a novelty by Timur Rajabov. And on move 22, Rajabov already had half an hour of a time advantage, putting a lot of pressure on Ding Liren. Uh, right, and in the other game, we do have, uh, well, precisely one more move played by Maxim Vichyarograf, which once again suggests that perhaps Maxim is in an uncomfortable situation. So, he has played, well, let me, let me bring this board, uh, well, this game again, to the analysis board. So rook fc8, queen a5, he, he spent some time himself, but again, now it is, Roger, uh, now it is Maxime Vichelle Graf who is thinking. So once again, white keeps the queen around those queenside pawns, not making it easy for black to to establish the coordination. Once again, the key move to be, oh, maybe not in this position now that I'm thinking, yeah, but on average, like b7, b6, and then move the a rook to the center. That would be how you're consolidating. But the little problem is that after b6, white keeps the queen over there on a6, and then the rook is still hanging. When you move the rook here, that's the moment you lose a7. So as long as you can't play b6, means your b7 pawn is constantly hanging, you can't move the d6 knight, all in all, not so pleasant situation. And this fc8 move, I do understand rook ac8 was not possible because of queen f7, but rook fc8, it's kind of a move you make when the position is not comfortable. Because it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Your rook on f8 was already on a semi-open file for it. It, it. it was useful, right? And you would love to develop the a8 rook unless it's that the a7 pawn will fall. I agree with you that it's a bit unpleasant if you need to continue this way with the rooks. Yeah. Happened to me so many times in my games when you have, for instance, the e and d files or like c, d, e. If you have more than two open files, let's say, and how do you want to place your rooks? And then you, you may end up regretting a few moves later your decision and the rook cannot fly over the other one. Yeah, well, it's, it's like an eternal question of which rook first or which rook to, well, or to which file. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the good advice would be not to overthink, because I do remember spending good 40 minutes trying to figure out if it's rook fe8 or rook a8, more precise. And what, was hap uh, what has happened right after, 
that my opponent had two rooks on e file, so immediately when I played rook e8, he snapped, <laughs> taken oh, no. on e8. It was, it was just an exchange of all four rooks. Oh no, I mean, you spent 40 for minutes some reason, on that yeah, move. That was, oh, I mean, no. those philosophical <laughs> murder, well, yeah, should I first put this rook so that I will have some king f8 option, or the other rook belongs to e8 if he doesn't take? And then, such a disappointment, he just swaps all the rooks. Um, those of you asking about the game extension on Twitch, we do have that as a panel. So if you are watching on Twitch and you scroll down the page, you can see the games. You can switch to the, the game of your choice and see the current position. I see there's also a slight engine evaluation with the bar next to the board. So it is a really cool new feature. You can, you can already do that on Twitch. Uh, head over to twitch.tv uh, slash fide underscore chess and you can follow the game, you can go back to a critical moment that you want to analyze yourself and uh, yeah, have a look at that. It's a new feature and I think it's really cool that Twitch is implementing more and more chess elements on their platform. Yeah, that makes it more and more pleasant and, and convenient to watch. Yeah, I'm really loving this feature. Earlier, it was an extension that would be on the screen, but I think a panel is better because it doesn't cover any part of the screen, especially if it was covering our own an analysis board. So here, it's a panel that's on the same uh, page. So all you need to do is just scroll down. If you are watching on Twitch, scroll down, and next to the chat rules and every other information among the panels, you can see the boards as well. Right, so no move from Maxime Bouchiello Graf. Once again, we consider his position to be uncomfortable. Not necessarily bad, bad, but yeah, not a pleasant, pleasant situation to be. And if we recall previous two games, they were quite solid draws, right? So we, we can say that that's the first point in the match where one side at, like, at least got something out of the opening, some playable position. Right. Well, we might argue yesterday was a playable position, was some game, but very quickly they, once again, coming back to my story, swapped all the rooks on the e-file. <laughs> could happen, could happen as well. Yeah, but here, I don't see this one simplifying anytime soon. Blur, white, of course, will try to keep as many pieces on the board as possible to make it inconvenient for black to protect his queen side and as well you know since rook f went to c8 i can picture a scenario where knight gets to d5 and black will have difficulties moving the queen because he has to stay on the long diagonal he can't say go to g5 allow white give a check on e5 just like basically this move loses in in, in one move queen e5 check Unlike with rook on f8, where you would be able to go back. So that's basically the point. Mm, in the other game, after rook c4, Rajabov goes bishop f6, and Ding Li Ren, no surprises here, would love to swap the bishops. So bishop g7. Now, indeed, if bishop g7 played, it'd be just the, you know, the rook end game we were discussing which is very likely a draw. So I would think that bishop e7 is what you're doing here. Trying to keep the b4 pawn alive. And, and still claiming that you can take on b2 as black, but white will take on a6. White takes on a6, yes. Yeah, so, well, I suspect this could be a critical position. Bishop f6, uh, sorry, bishop c3, and then bishop b4 being a, a threat. And so rook b6, bishop b4... I know, that, that's just like, that was silly, rook b6. I wanted to illustrate that, again, even if white gets three versus two, after the bishop swap, it's very likely a draw. But it could be that white has some tactical tricks like that. Like rook a7, force the king to g8, maybe some, somehow. Not that I can see how to reach it. Full concentration by Temur Jabov. This is his chance to come back in this match. Tomorrow he will have the black pieces. So obviously 
he must have had in mind that putting pressure on Ding Liren in today's game, that is his task, and he found the variation in the Marshall. When we saw today that it was going to be the Rui Lopez, the Marshall variation, um, we were a little bit disappointed about his approach, but he proved us wrong because he played a move 21, a novelty, and he had his point that it would be a slightly better position for White where he can keep putting pressure on Ding Liren. So Ding Liren did feel uncomfortable about that position, spent half an hour on move 22, and ever since he's on the defensive side, yes, with precise defense, maybe he will be out of the woods, but Rajabov did find the best practical chance, I believe. Yeah, and once again, it's a very strange... Well, we've never... We haven't talked about it, but, but four games. It's a very strange format. It but is. It's a longer match than two, but not much longer, because I would say, like, trading per one game and having, say, five more games in front of him, four more games in front of him, then that would be just the perfect game to try. And then... When it's your last game with White, but not last game of the match, then that's what makes it awkward. So, but anyway, good, good, good try by Rajabo. It is a very good attempt. Let's just see if there's any new move in the other game before we go on a break. Mm -hmm. There is. There is. After Queen A5, Rook to C4 was played by Maxime Vichelecraft. Uh, well, trying somehow tactically solve the the issue of his pieces not being well coordinated. So, Rook to c4, attacking the f4 knight. And I suspect a move like g3 is, well, not that anyone would consider g3, but in case you, you guys would, I believe Rook takes, Pawn takes, and Bishop d3 is clearly, well, a change of the position, which is in Black's uh, favor, right? So <laughs> Taking away too many pieces. Damaged, yeah, like kind of damage the white, white's king pawn uh, uh, shelter and then returns back the exchange after capturing one of the rooks. That be, should be okay for Black. Uh, right, so rook c4, but white has, well, at first glance, knight d5 is what you play, right? I mean... It's just a very natural move. The knight move is hanging, the knight is perfectly placed on d5. And then Maxime will have to answer where, where he's planning to put his queen. Queen d4. Want to keep it on long diagonal again. Very likely because going to g5 so far doesn't really hurt, but. Or maybe it does after queen a3. Queen a3. Attack the knight, and queen b2 is a serious threat. And this is kind of the situation you want to avoid. So after knight d5, I suspect the move is queen d4. Then it runs into some tempo with rook d2 and so on. So I'm starting to be worried by Maxim. I would definitely be worried here as black. We shall see what's the idea of the world number 6 with rook c4, provoking knight d5, and then uh, going for possibly queen d4 was going to happen in that position but that's all yet to see after a short break uh, join us in a few minutes this is the match for the first place between ding liren and timur rajabov and for the third place between yu yangi and maxim vachel lagrav <laughs>
That has been the trophy Ding Liren and Timur Rajabov are playing for. Ding Liren has taken the lead yesterday with a victory, but today it seems that Rajabov is putting pressure on him. He has a pawn up in an endgame. We shall see whether Ding Liren will find a way to get a draw out of that, but he's on the defensive side. While in the other match, it is the other Chinese player, Yu Yangyi, who managed to outsmart Maxim somewhere still in the opening. We are struggling to find the exact moment when things went wrong for Maxim Vashlagrov. He made a novelty on move 12 by playing f5, but a few moves later we already thought that his position was becoming really unpleasant. Right. So, uh, once again, coming back to this move 12 f5, which seems to be, you know, a challenging move attacking white center, but uh, after castle short, and that's the move you expect from white to play, castle short, the most logical follow-up has actually happened in the game. So he takes the pawn. After knight f4, he's practically forced to go for that. And then e5, knight e6, I suspect, would be white's reaction. This looks very dangerous as well. And the move Maxim ended up playing practically by force leads to this very, very unpleasant position with the open center, with white pieces being better coordinated, right? And the follow-up is seemingly logical once again, like has to develop. So bishop f5, move is the tempo. It could be that he missed this bishop b2, nice resource. It's a very pretty you. detail. One more time, the rook cannot be taken. Yeah, because of uh, bishop takes b2, followed by knight e6 check, winning the queen. Uh, yeah, but once again, so takes, takes, like making all the logical moves up to that point. And then over here, the position already seems unpleasant, but the last few moves seem to make the situation even worse. Queen d4, indeed. Remember, right before the bre uh, break, we were wondering what happens after knight d5. Yeah, queen d4 was played, rook to e7, and as long as this diagonal on a1, h8 is, this queen might be running out of squares on this diagonal. So rook d1 is the potential threat, and then if queen has to leave, a1, H8 diagonal, it's just a disaster for black. Yes, you can still try to move the queen to B2, but the, my feeling about the black pieces is as if you would throw your pieces into the air and then they stand on the board as they fall, because there's not much coordination between black's pieces, and that's really troublesome, adding to it the factor that the black king is vulnerable. Yeah, and, you know, as soon as black doesn't control df6 square, let's say black goes queen d3 for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. He loses on, his, ah, well, not with queen d3, but it's like knight f6 is a very, very dangerous thing to, 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 I don't know, well, actually white does win, yeah, knight f6, g5 being the only move to avoid the checkmate, then queen e5. I believe that that's the moment where you declare white to be winning. Back There's to no d4 to and the queen king. f5. For instance, with rook h7, checkmate to follow. Beautiful. Of, of course, yeah, of course, queen d3 is not the move you're playing. It's bad on, because of few reasons. But just to illustrate that black is already not very comfortable. Rook a to c8, yes, of course, makes much more sense. Kf to c8, being ready to meet rook d1 with rook c1, I suspect. That's, that's the point behind Maxim's last move. But I'm looking at moves like queen a3 in this position, disturbing this knight on d6, covering the b2 square, covering the c1 square. So if the knight goes, oh, well, knight b5 with a tempo, maybe that's, that's what uh, Maxime will have to do, because not that many squares to move that knight. And it's very likely that black gets into trouble. So we'll see how this develops. Uh, it, hmm, well, honestly, I think that that could be some direct ways available for white. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Rook AC it seems to be a really strong move for the fact that it prevents the main threat of white, Rook D1. And uh, even like this, I agree with Yevgeny fully that the human intuition is saying that in this position there could be something direct immediately with the Rook on the seventh rank, this monster knight on D5, the 
Black King not having any defenders around it. The yeah. long diagonal is wide open and so is the seventh rank. You just need to find a way to bring the white queen into the game and it would be over. Uh, right, uh, well that's uh, Yunyan Yi has 40 minutes to do that. It's mil 24 and well, so he can spend his time trying to identify what will be the best way, the most challenging way for black to to face in this position. Yeah, yeah the good again, detail for, the from Black's perspective is that it's not that simple to bring the white queen into the attack. Yeah, like thanks this. To the <laughs> thanks to like the black this. queen on d4. Like uh, yeah, <laughs> we <Nah>. would need to. <laughs> what kind of chess is that? I think I used to play a chess variant in chess camps as a kid, and we had. I don't know if it's an official chess variant or our trainers just made it up, but we played as if the board would continue from the A file to the H file. So imagine like if yeah, it was a like ball. Glute or yeah. a ball. Yeah, or imagine yeah. there's a 3D. Cylinder. And indeed, so you would be able to move from the A file over to G5, for instance. Queen G5 would be a possible move here. Yeah, right. So, well, this is luckily for Maxim Vashielograph is not possible in our variant of the game, but his position is still seems to be not very pleasant one. Uh, and you know what? I'm ready to say the same about Rajabov's, uh, oh, rather Ding Li Ren's position against Rajabov. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Ding Li Ren has chances to draw the game, but still Rajabov managed to keep his extra pawn to, well, not to trade the bishop, so it's not yet a rook game. And I'm wondering if Ding Li Ren will actually be able to make a draw comfortably. So back to this game between Rajabov and Ding Li Ren, the final game three. Bishop to f6 is what we've seen. That was the key move after rook c4 to keep the game going. Otherwise, black would be able to simplify and basically achieve his, his goal. So bishop to g7, bishop to e7. It turns out bishop b2, remember we were looking at this, but for some reason Ding Liren didn't like it. So perhaps there was the way for white to apply pressure. And what he ended up doing was rook to c6. He's trying to guard his own a six pawn rook to a2 king g8 trying to bring it to f7 and bishop to c5 and uh, we're going to continue with this analysis i just wanted to mention that on the other board yu yang yi still went for rook d1 allowing okay. rook c1 so he must have something up his sleeve for that position oh well that's that's an interesting that's an interesting follow-up so what's that rook, so really I agree. Since we, we, we see this move, we have to switch to this game. Then we'll come back to the end game, yeah. don't worry. Well, the end game in Rajab of Ding Liren, first of all, it's move 34 and the position has stabilized. It's a pawn up for Rajabov and I would go and say good chances for a draw for Ding Liren. So this means, since Rajabov is not a big supporter of a draw result in his last remaining white, white game. This will be a very long game. So Tamer will keep trying, the Ingliran will keep defending. What's going to happen, we don't know. But over here, it seems to be a really, really critical moment. So Rook to D1. And the feeling is, Maxim was betting at Rook C1 here. So, well, I'm trying to understand what White's plan is in this case. So he's going there. Is white plan? Well, I don't see it. Rook back to e1, perhaps. That's the only thing that I can imagine. So you go back to e1, and if black captures, white captures back, and black has too much stuff to defend, it seems. It's an a7 pawn and the king side as well. So he wouldn't mind bringing back the rook from the 7th rank where it's really active if it was for something as concrete as this position where the black queen is struggling to keep everything defended. Yeah, it's like you go queen b2, at the very least you lose the a7 pawn. Uh, the only way to keep the a7 pawn lines alive seems to be queen c5, but then after queen d2, you know, that's the threat. 
the night might be uncomfortable after knight e7, and the dream of bringing the queen to h6 can all of a sudden materialize. Rook back to e1 played. Indeed, that is the plan of Yu Yang Yi. Rook back to e1 played, and still 30, uh, 30 minutes for Maxim, 34 minutes for Maxim Bashir graphs, and no issues with the time just yet, but the situation is unpleasant on the board. So what do you do then? I mean, you after... You cannot just not take on d1 because the queen will be hanging, so rook takes d1, rook takes d1. And this is, once again, I was, I was thinking of, well, technically this is a move which you can play. So you keep the diagonal, and it, but it doesn't make sense because for some reason I thought black is attacking the d1 rook. He would be attacking the d1 rook from d4 as well, so it kind of doesn't make sense. Yeah, you uh, can't put more at pressure the, At the there. very least, white can take on a7. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there should Indeed. be better moves than that, but, but at the very least, white can take on a7. So, no, queen a1 is not what you're looking for. Then you probably end up taking on d1, and then, well, I don't know, perhaps, perhaps it's the time to give up the a7 pawn and fight for a draw. And still this knight on d6 is so awkward. Speaking of knight on d6 being awkward, could it be that knight c4 is a possible move? Like trying to trick white a little bit. Attacking the queen, I suspect that black will survive in this case. It's not the perfect coordination, the knight on a5 is not ideal, but at least it's an endgame, so no worries, more or less, no worries about the king. But after knight c4, of course, you have many other moves. With the queen, like queen b4, opting to e7, don't know, really. I mean, that's, that's, um, that's one tough position to navigate. And Maxim sort of agrees, because he's still looking for, for the alternative of uh, capturing, on, capturing on d1. It's like knight c4 immediately. The chat is confirming that you are finding the very best moves. Yeah, Evgeny is on fire. I agree with so you guys. What do you mean? I agree. Takes, takes knight c4 or...? Takes, takes knight c4. Well, I, I, I don't believe it myself, even though it could be the best move in the position. Maxime is about to make a move, so we will see very shortly. But really, but he doesn't want... Uh, well, he was about to touch one of his pieces, and it wasn't white's rook on d1, so he's not planning to, at least as it stands for now, he's not planning to take on d1. And in the other game, in case you were wondering, it really slowed down, and the situation is the same. Pawn up for a job of decent chances to save uh, for being the ran. Knight to c4 at once. Knight to c4 at once, not swapping the pair of rooks. Optically, black is achieving something with these last couple of moves because he started putting pressure on white pieces. But it still feels like there is something wrong with this. It's just yeah. a feeling. I don't know the refutation. Yeah, right, but is it? Any different if, say, white plays queen b4? Because he's still threatening to capture the queen, right? He's still threatening to capture the queen. So after rook d1, rook d1. I don't see a move there. Oh, wow, queen g7, technically, keeps this one alive. Then again, some 97, well, so it's such a, such a complex tactical position, so it's very easy to miss something. We are getting it's a very, very nice close-up of the g7 square that you are showing, whether the queen will end yeah, up there. Yeah, queen g7 still keeping 
control over the diagonal plus guarding the b7 pawn. But even this might prove to be not enough after knight e7 because the rook's hanging. Knight f5 is a move with the tempo in case the queen is somehow attacked in return. Plus b7 pawn is targeted. So this actually does look very, very bad for black. So I'm yet to understand what, uh, what is the planned reaction after queen b4. And not like it's a hard move for white to spot. It's not that many moves that she has. <laughs> queen Valley queen has a four or b4, right? Okay, b5, three, three squares. Three squares only. Yes, but the queen b4 makes so much sense because mm. it's a multi-purpose move. Yeah, it's like target this, have queen e7 as an idea, still keep under control two squares on this long diagonal. Remember we are saying that if somehow white gets to the long diagonal, black cannot challenge the white queen on this diagonal, then white is simply winning. With knight on d5, usually this check on long diagonal is deadly because you have to go to g8 and then everything collapses. And the move is? The move is surprisingly queen b4. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A shocker. Maxim obviously had this in mind, so he was about to make his response immediately. R Rook takes d1. That's okay. Is there any kind of tactic he wants to, wants to come up with? I don't see any. So Rook takes, Rook takes. And someone please tell me why white is not winning here. Or he, <laughs> it could be that he actually mm. is. What are the possibilities for black? Let's just have a quick uh, yeah, run yeah. through candidate yeah, 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 moves. Yeah. Knight is not moving because queen is taken with the check. That's okay, a, elimination. That's clever, yeah, <laughs> elimination method. So the, the bishop is not moving, the queen is taken. The rook is not moving, the queen. Ah, surprise, black has to move the queen. All right, we came to this conclusion. To conclusion yeah. <laughs> the queen has uh, to move. Then queen c5, queen b7, we stop right there, right? White is the pawn up. The pawn up and the, uh, the attack continues. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not like black all of a sudden gets compensation or gets his pieces perfectly coordinated. It's just a pawn up for good. Mm, so it's a choice between queen g7, which in my opinion was very bad after knight e7, or there is a second option, which is queen to b2. Which might be better version, yeah. Queen to b2. But then again, then white has quite a choice. Uh, going to e7 with the queen. Oh, well, this queen, not that much of a choice now that I'm thinking. Queen b2, you will have to play queen e7. But the very next move of black, I don't really know. Knight f6 being a huge threat. And then back to g7. And maybe he holds like that. To try to trade queens. Yeah. Obviously for black, if this is the position, but with no queens on the board, his chances are absolutely improving. So he is insisting on the queen trade with queen yeah. b2 and possibly after queen e7, queen g7. Which might still not be enough for equality, but of course, as you said, improves black chances quite a bit. We believe that white will neither trade queens nor repeat moves. That's not in his interest. And it's not that difficult to keep the queens on the board. There are plenty of squares yeah, such as queen, queen g5, queen h4. And to add to this, there might be situations where white says, if you want to trade, trade but then you lose some material. So like, go g4, because in fact, bishop is sort of awkward on f5. Now it's not that easy to figure out where the bishop has to go. Because even with queen straight, if white gets the knight on f6 and his rook on seventh, he's winning because of a checkmate threat, even with uh, queens being traded. So Yu Yang Yi is thinking here where his alternatives are. Once again, queen e7. Uh, well, technically, queen e1 is the other move which keeps the queens on the board. But it's far less appealing, it seems. Yeah, queen e1, at the very least, queen e5 back.
Yeah, you just play queen e7, and then go from there. I am expecting the position that you showed, queen e7, queen g7, and in that position we shall see whether the queen will move away from e7 or an idea like uh, g5, uh, g4 that you said that even if black would have the possibility to trade queens but it's under the circumstances that white wants so you end up losing material. Yeah, well, once again, if you look at g4, I don't think queen takes e7 is possible. No, you lose a piece. Knight takes, rook c7, there is knight back to d5. Rook e8, so far you are still holding, but this might be just lost, because f6 and rook cannot go to f7. Rook has to go back to e8 because of a back rank uh, checkmate threat. This might end up being just lost for black. It's so. looking troublesome for the French man. Yuyang still hasn't decided whether to play Queen E7. What else do you think he's considering? Because Queen E7 seems to be the most straightforward move. Mm, honestly, I have difficulties finding the alternative because, well, Queen A4, but it's sort of counterintuitive, right? Well, it is tactically possible because Bishop D7, as uh, her Bishop C2, the risk Queen D7. That's that. Hence the D7 square. But, funny enough, it may end up being the same situation after bishop f5 back, queen e7, and uh, queen g7. Any updates in the other game, I'm wondering? I uh, know this yeah. is the exciting position, and the other one is a slow yes. end game. Well, the slow end game slowly but surely approaches the time control, move 37. Rajabo is still on very comfortable 56 minutes. He managed to, well, preserve the tension on the board, so there is no immediate draw, no immediate simplifications. So what has happened after king g8 was bishop to c5, king f7, king g2, and I was still expecting black to look for bishop f6, bishop e7, or bishop f8 on the previous move to try to get the rook endgame. But no, Ding we ran improves the king's position. b3, h5, king f3, and king to f5. Uh, well, point being that despite the b pawn went to b3, and similarly white's rook is free, Ding is trying to prove that it's an illusion, because after rook d2, for instance, so that's what you normally want to do, rook d2, in order to go rook, e, uh, rook d4 check, bring the king closer to the center, black will have an opportunity to play a6, a5. Using, and that will be a liberating fact, move, yeah. Yeah, using the fact that the bishop is uh, hanging on c5. So I suspect, uh, yeah, well, and we can continue this line because, say, white goes back, says, okay, let's trade and continue. And if I'm not mistaken, black has a funny-looking move, bishop c3. And then still you can't take with the pawn because the bishop is still there. If you take with the rook, rook c5, and the pawn is pinned. So with those tricks, Ding Ren is trying to make it awkward for white to achieve, you know, further progress, let's say so. So White, yes, improved his position quite a bit, but how to, how to continue? The time difference is pretty significant, 40 minutes, but Ding Liren is going to receive an additional half an hour, so is Tamar Rajabo, but he doesn't really need it. This is move yeah. 37, so three more moves to be played and the players get an additional half an hour. The position I, exactly how Yevgeny described, there are these tactical elements with the pawn push to a5, with the c5 bishop hanging, that why it should always take into account uh, when moving the rook away from the a file. Uh, well, and now that I've uh, discovered this idea of bishop c3 and then a5, it could be that that's actually the motif Black is looking for himself. Like, say, white does nothing. It's kind of to identify what black strat is. So obviously nobody's going to play king g2. But bishop c3 and then he threatens a5. 
Yes. So that's yeah, that's kind of the way t- way Black is planning to organize contemplate. So, so if White doesn't do anything immediately, then Bishop C3 A5 is going to be the follow up for Black. Yeah. So it could be that White actually has to try to sneak with the king to help his uh, queenside pawn survive, like king to E3. Then one of the options for Black would be to go to G4. In this case, to F3. And it's hard to say. I mean, it's like F2 pawn. Uh, well, first of all, the bishop on C5 is ideal. It guards two weaknesses at the same time, yeah? But with black king being that active, it might still be acceptable for black. So it's like, if any kind of simplification happens, black king is already there, starting eliminating those king side pawns. A question in the Twitch chat about the position with rook d2, a5, rook d5, king e6, whether white can just simply go rook to g5. Oh, well, he can, right? And that means, that means I'm blundering stuff. I was a bit worried about this a4 thing, but probably doesn't work. Does it work tactically? Because there is a move like king f7, and if white captures, and I suspect that's, that's why you put your rook on g5 that you were planning to capture, but then bishop f6, attacking the rook, rook d5, king e6. This works for, this works for black, it seems, yeah? The rook is hanging. Now that I realize, after bishop f6, there is a 5a6 move, which would lead to a weird position, because now rook a6, rook d5, white managed to undouble the pawn, so well, just a clear pawn up for white. Not clear if it's winning, but sort of improved his chances. And if you capture the rook, then a6, a7 happens, this and this. And that's not an easy position to evaluate. So it's two pawns for an exchange, a very far advanced a7 pawn, which ties down the rook to a certain degree, but white's going to have difficulties organizing the other passed pawn. So, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but Rajabov goes for rook d2. 13 minutes left for Dingeren. Once again, it's not much of a time pressure with only three more moves that the Chinese Grandmaster needs to play to get extra time. I believe this is the moment where it's uh, about precise calculation. Like He has to make sure if he plays a5 that it works yeah. and he doesn't fall into something like uh, honestly, that rook g5 variation. Yeah. You know, honestly, if... Uh, a6, A5 doesn't work in this position. That means bad news, because if you try to play it slow, basically you don't have any like forcing move apart from A5. So let's say you, you pass, you go bishop F6. Then white gets to play rook D5, drive the king to E6, and go king, king E4. Then white is a pawn up, plus all of his pieces are more active than black's counterparts. Rook is tied down to 6th rank in view of rook, C6, uh, rook d6 check. No, th- this is just a winning position for white, I believe. If he gets this position, yeah. yes, this could be yeah. <laughs> an and almost immediate resignation. Plan being very simple. f4, f5, swap those pawns, take on h5, win the game. But if this is the case, then we have to go back to the move a5. Yeah, and try to make it work. Because that's the only way out. Yeah. Try to make it work. So once again, rook check to d5. We said king e6, that, that seems to be logical, right? So attack it with the tempo. Rook to g5. The, and then I don't see anything. It's like I was even looking at a weird way to try to trap the rook. Rook h6, but it doesn't really work. There is always one square. There's always one square for this rook. King g7, he takes, king g6, no, well, the rook on h5 can be protected as well, yeah, so that's, that, was, that was just silly. So after rook g5, g6 pawn needs to be protected. And then it means king f7. 
but then the bishop is protected on c5. Yeah, and that was the line I was looking at. Bishop yeah, let's have a look six. at it one more time. Yeah, rook d5. No, but that, I'm saying nonsense, Anna. Rook d5, king e6, there is king e4, white's winning completely. I just... Uh, it's got a couple of moves before I was talking about this possibility, now I've completely forgotten. No, it's not a move for black. I mean, black can't do this. And if he can't do a5, then he might be in a very tight spot. This could be trouble for Ding Liren, who won yesterday a brilliant game against Tamar Rajabov, and it seemed that he, he was very close to getting that title because all he needed was basically Space surviving solid? today's game, and tomorrow he will have the white pieces. So if it's a draw today, then it's highly likely that Ding Liren will have no problem tomorrow to make a draw with the white pieces yeah. and get the title. But he isn't really making a draw here. He is under serious pressure, bone down, and a5 doesn't seem to work at all. Yeah, so well, that, then really the question becomes what, what move Black's playing. So he really needs something to happen. I'm still curious why he decided not to trade the bishops. So I can move before, a couple of moves before. Well, particularly the moment after king g8, bishop c5, there was bishop f8. There was bishop forcing f8. Forcing the trade of the bishops. That's more or less forcing the trade of the bishops. And even a line like b3, bishop c5, rook c2, which could have been problematic with the king on g2, now doesn't work because of bishop f2 with a check. So bishop f8, white would have been forced to take on f8, king takes, and... I don't know what, what the problem is, to be honest, because white doesn't really have that many active moves on, on this side of the board. Like the, well, you can move the rook, but not that it improves the position much. So say king g2, and then black would need to make one more move in preparation. First play king f7, guard the pawn, and then he can switch to the defensive method that, that we've already mentioned. Takes there and then b2 pawns hanging. Yeah? Or possibly king g7 would have been more precise not to, not to worry about h4, h5. Dingliran so has not played a5 but bishop, bishop to e5. e5. That's okay, but now after rook d5, what's his next move? Because bishop d4 is a threat, a direct threat of winning the game on the spot. So to prevent that, you need to get out of the pen. Yeah, you, you, you need to move the king, and then king e4 happens. Then he can keep the bishop on this diagonal to sort of stop white's adva uh, the advance of white's pawns over there. But still, that seems to be critical. This is very troublesome for the Ren. And... I don't quite understand. I mean, what happened so that he got outplayed so, I want to say, easily? Okay, it wasn't easy, but, well, Ding Li Ren, who is known to find, like, most critical continuations and so on and so on, and now this position is really bad. And it seems that, look, in this game, last, say, light surprising move, last surprising tactical move that Ding Li Ren played, was back on move 23 when he went for knight b4. And after that, he was always choosing, like, I don't want to say inferior moves, but it's like he was always on the defensive and so on and so on. So, so where do you think was the last critical moment where he may have made an inaccurate move? It's not, like, not that he made any blunders, but yeah. inaccuracies we are talking about. I believe uh, letting white to keep the bishop. So bishop c8, I, I'm playing bishop f8 all day, every day. Yeah, which is very logical also from the standpoint that all rook and games are drawn. <laughs> but yeah. here it makes sense that bishop and c5 is strong. Why would you not want to trade it and try to play a rook and game? It will be interesting to see what Ding Liren had in mind if we get to talk to him after the game. Of course, this is nowhere near the end, but it does look like Tim Rajabov 
has a great chance to make a comeback today, tie the score, and then tomorrow it will be whether one of them can win in that classical game where Ding will have the white pieces, or we get to see tie breaks yeah, on Friday. It might as well be. Yeah, Rook F6, I thought could be a funny idea of discovered attack with you know with taking the rook, but it's not it's not even a threat. Because the king it's will not, defend yeah, the rook. King, Let's king just show it. Will. Let's show it. Yeah, I don't know. Well, bishop a7, a check doesn't really help because king comes back and guards the rook. So really, I don't, I don't see a move for, for Ding Li Ren. It's like he has to play king e6, king e4, and has to suffer. Yeah. Maybe it won't be like really easy for white to convert, but we are talking about technical position, so there is no more question. So before that, it was like white is up a double spawn and, and black is fighting for a draw. Now, 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 if white acts precisely, it doesn't matter who is playing for black. It can be the computer playing for black and white's Could be half a zero. Could be half yeah. a zero, too. So that's what I'm trying to claim. And let us switch to the other game. Sure. Because but uh, our yeah, evaluation, Timur Rajavo, quite possibly winning today and will tie the score. Uh, what a comeback it will be if it happens. Ding Liran will definitely need to check what is it that he did wrong. It was a novelty on move 21, queen takes f5 by Rajabov. It's not a winning novelty or anything like that. It was slight pressure simply that Rajabov managed to get out of the opening. The marshal is known to be very theoretically yeah. solid and leading oftentimes to draws, but not today. Rajabov came very well prepared. Kudos to the other grandmaster if he gets that full point. It's still obviously not confirmed. Mm, yeah. And what happens over here? Still, we are wondering what went wrong in for the Maxime. opening for Maxim Vishyalograph, but he seems to be struggling. Queen b2, queen e7, queen g7, that's what we've managed to guess. And you know what? g4 played, and Maxim replied with bishop d7. Does he mean he's holding? Which is really hard to believe. The position still looks so suspicious. Yeah, absolutely. So now the question is, how do we do it with white? Because trading the queens, if you don't get any immediate benefits, which seemingly, yeah, which seemingly wasn't, white doesn't get in this case. Yeah, knight e7, there is rook c7. Then that's what white doesn't want to do. What he might want to do, and there is also, yeah, the, the other factor to mention that black might have a knight e5 as an idea. What white might want to do is to play rook e1, stopping knight e5, and now... White actually threatens to trade himself on g7 because rook e7 will win a piece. Queen g7, rook e7 check, take the bishop. If black captures, seems like he's just lost because the bishop's hanging and there is knight f6 with rook h7 checkmate threat. So rook e1 seems to be a decent try for Even Yuyang Even without Yil. the queens on the board, it would yes. be a mating net. And then, then Maxime will have to have to find the resource to save, which on is the other not board, easy. We have, oh, okay, mm, we do have a move here and also G7. on the other board. That's Just wanted to mention that Ding Liren played King e6, allowing King e4, but it may have been already a necessity, even if it's bad. Yeah, but th that's, that's what has happened. But that, as I said, that seems to be just a winning position for Timur Rajabov. So Queen g7, to my surprise, Maxim for some mysterious reason, spends some time before taking on g7, but ends up making the only available move in the position. And knight e3, e3 the move that I've honestly missed completely. Okay, so the bishop on d7 is hanging with a check. If knight yeah, takes e3, rook d7 first, and you win so a piece. You, yeah, you can't take there. Uh, well, you do have bishop c6, though, it seems. This might be good enough, you know. Can we just show real quick that uh, so knight takes e3 is not no, possible? No, knight e3 is bad because check first and then you take on e3. This is the point and, uh, and, ah, and the game is over. The game is over 
And I don't think Black has resigned. I believe it was, was a drug read. I am because shocked. Of, I believe because of Bishop C6. And then you take, and Black takes. You can win one of the pawns. Yeah. It a is draw. a draw. It is a draw. What a shocking turn of events from a position where we thought Yu Yang Yi has a very pleasant advantage. He decides to trade the queens. Even there, right? Even like two months before. Yeah, why did he do this to himself? He, doesn't, he didn't believe that he has winning chances here. He should be way better. That's the intuition, and we don't even know the evaluation. Yeah, but, it, but that, that's really surprising, right? It's it really is surprising. Very surprising. And, and you know what, Anna? I'm looking at various positions, like after this rookie one move, like even rook f8, which saves the piece, because after rookie seven, there is rook f7. Yeah? feeling is like white is still white's, uh, white's position is so rich of ideas like for instance i was looking at g5 rook f3 knight f6 these kind of things and then again the bishop on d7 is hanging queen d8 is a threat if you trade over here it's very tough to prevent rook h7 checkmate after rook h3 rook d7 this should be i mean you never agree a draw at first place i mean in this position but white is close to be winning yeah. probably is winning so oh, it does really feel surprised. like Maxime has escaped from the jaws of death. He was in a worse position where Yu Yangi could have tried, but instead he took on g7 and played knight e3, offered a draw. Obviously it was accepted, but by this point it seems that Maxime is out of the woods. I still can't believe that Yu Yangi didn't find chances in that position for him. And I'm being told that King e6 was a mistake by Ding Liren, according to you guys both on Twitch and YouTube. So thank you so much for your comments. Saying that King f6 was a better defense than King e6. King f6 point uh, B after this move to go rook e6 Must maybe. Must be the point, yes. Ah, uh, yeah kind of trying to drive the king away from e4, which is a great square, of course. Uh, so king e6, king e4, bishop f6, f4, that was, I believe, one of the positions that I've declared completely winning for white. So let's see if it's through. So bishop c3, obviously looking for at least some way to put up some fight. So bishop is heading to e1. So now, f5. He's about to win a second pawn on h5. Black goes bishop e1. And honestly, I don't see what stops white from, you know, just playing it slow. Go there, go to f3, take on h5. Since white has the rook on fifth rank, a5 is no longer an idea. So it will be two pawns up. This should be a winning position for a job of... Uh, well, now you guys get tired of, tired of me <laughs> repeating that, but... No, there are no updates on the evaluation. No, it <laughs> has to be a winning position, but then we can go back to the moment where you guys suggested king f6 instead of king e6. And the world number three didn't play it. I'm assuming it's an engine suggestion, unless uh, everyone is a genius in the chat. That the world number three didn't play it, so it's not an obvious move. King f6 instead of king e6. Yeah, but then once again, it's, it's not like it would be an, an immediate draw. Oh, it I doesn't mean, force it's, it's any still, draw. Yeah, it's still, still white is better, white is, white is fighting for, for the advantage. It's, kind of, it's an improvement over king e6, but still black's position seems to be pretty tough. So now having this on the board. Uh, well, once again, f5 is very tempting. There is another thing to discuss and much more, much more full thing. Bishop e1, white can try to prove that this is a winning position. To take on h5, I suspect black takes on g3, give a check, trade on c6. Well, actually, Anna, isn't it just winning 
by fours. It could well be. Yeah, so f5, maybe I'm missing something there. Is there any other move? Oh, well, he can try to go to f7. Maybe that's what he has in mind. Go to f7 or, or f6, whatever, and take over there with the king. Yeah, that, that's probably what he wants to play. Not that I'm impressed by this option, and it actually loses as well. Rook g5, king h6, bishop check from f8, two pawns up. Yeah, so back to this, what I've called the forcing winning line. f5, g takes, rook takes, bishop e1. Capture on h5, give a check on h6, trade the rooks, go h5. And then from afar, I was a bit worried about a5, where you cannot take. But what you can do is go h6, try to, to go h7, and then, then you just promote the pawn. Yes. Six, it next move bishop d4. I mean, if, if, if it's this or this planning to stop, mm -hmm. you just go or h7 bishop d4. No, that's completely winning. So f5 is very likely to lead to completely winning position for Timur Rajab. And what we can see on the camera is a very sad story because Ding Liren is obviously aware of the fact that his position is lost. He knows it, and, and this is the moment when grandmasters go back in their uh, memory, trying to recall the moments where he could have played something else. Where is it that he went wrong in this game? And the match will be once again wide open. Yeah, absolutely. And then once again, yeah, well the moments where Black clearly had alternatives to what he has done. That was this moment where he could have opted for the rook endgame, but that's already a pawn down position. So, you know, and then tracking all the way back, could it be that night before, in fact, is not a great idea, even though it, it was looking decent, but could it be that the simplistic approach that I was advocating would have been a better try. So takes, takes, and... You know. I well, just can't stop looking at the camera a, and how obvious it is that the uh, game the is Iran, over. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's correct. Yeah, so Jabov, of course, will spend time here. He's, he has more than one hour. And he's not in the mood to leave, uh, uh, to, you know, to let his advantage slip in such a situation. When it was such an important victory for him, I mean, such an important um, thing to win this particular game, to make it anyone's match, go into the last game with the black pieces. But, yeah, judging from Ding Liren's facial expression, the game is over. He, he kind of given up. Yes, that is clearly the story. And I would like to know, you guys here on Twitch and YouTube, how many of you predicted this? Because I will be honest here, I didn't think that Rajabov had much hopes for this match after yesterday's game, Dingleren being the player that barely ever loses games in classical chess. So what did you guys think? Did you think that Rajabov had a good chance to make a comeback today? Obviously, if you are rooting for Rajabov, that's, that's what you should be believing in. But uh, I'm really curious, how many of you would have predicted this outcome for today? Uh, well, the, there, was, there was another, one more moment in this game where the play for Ding Liren could be improved. And I was actually praising him for taking on c8. I thought it should be an easy way to make a draw in the rook end game. Uh, would he gone for the swap of the bishops? But I was once again told in our chat that knight c2, which leads to these opposite colors, and I suspect not rook d4, but a6, a5, this could have been a draw uh, as well. Hmm. This could have been a very good chance for a draw as well. So, so the opposite colors, you probably don't care much about the deep one, it's not, it's not that dangerous. What you really want to do is to create a passed pawn of your own, so pushing those queenside pawns help, helps, or the other thing you might want to do is to get rid of those pawns at all, so like to take on b2. It's a couple of missed moments by Ding Liran not playing the most accurate move. There's no big mistake he made, but 
plenty of inaccurate moves. The novelty you guys are asking about was a move 21, queen takes f5, but it's nowhere near a dramatic novelty yeah. that changes the theory of this opening. It was more about building up on a slight pressure and making the English very uncomfortable. He started thinking from that moment on. He was always behind on the clock, half an hour time advantage for uh, Timur from the very beginning. And then Dingleran didn't find the best way to simplify into an endgame that he could hold. This one is already a lost endgame, pawn down, and it's going to be just uh, even more. So f5, once again, seems to be, uh, well, seems to be a very, very direct way to win the game. Um, looking at any kind of possible alternatives for black not to allow because basically gf5 rook f5 is game over so black is it good or bad but black has to has to play king f7 hoping to take on g6 with the rook oh well maybe this is still playable maybe this is still playable but f 5s played f5 I believe black has to go king f7. Because this is just too straightforward. Don't see... Yeah, king f7. Still fighting. It's just such a difficult situation because it's a pawn down for Dingley and passive pieces, no active counterplay. What we were describing in previous broadcasts with Yevgeny is that sometimes you wish that the engine evaluation would be a bigger advantage for your opponent, but at least you have some tricks in the position Absolutely. or something more complex. Kind of some disbalance, right? Mm -hmm. So that, uh, well, your opponent's factors are more important. So he's like, for instance, he's material up, like two pawns up, but you have some attack. Yeah. So that's at least a possibility for your opponent to go wrong. Or you have a lot of weaknesses, but then once again, you know, a chance to drag it to some drawish rook endgame. Again, so there are factors, that, but here's like nearly everything is bad. The pawn down, much more active pieces for white. White doesn't even have to find the top move of the engine. A couple of moves will be winning in most positions here. Very sad story for Dingley Rand. There might Not, be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say that a couple of more moves will be played, but I don't think this game will go on for too long. I will depends. Check. Uh, and what's the, what's the direct way for white? Because I was considering this, trying to simplify it even further. I'm not sure if white is winning. Strangely enough, it's like white probably can. I know he white doesn't win a second pawn. King f7, what saves black? Yeah, so I was looking at this, and then white is marching with the king, but black seems to be on time to go there. And then the fact that those pawns are fixed on dark squares is not very helpful. So, in this case, you might not be winning. King b6, king gets there, takes, takes. That's actually the, the, the king got stuck on a6. And that's not the most technical way. No, no, probably there is no way. No way white has to trade the rooks. Probably keep the rooks on the board. Rook d7 check played, however. Well, nothing wrong with that, driving the king further away. We shall see. That's a, once again, to repeat myself, that's a technical task for Timur Rajabov. That, and if he finds the best way, so nothing should save Ding Li Ren. So where the king is going? It's hesitating. Well, you go to 8th rank, I mean, it's king of, yeah, king to g8. That's precisely what I was looking at. And then if only there was a way to, to win one more tempo with white, like say go to d5 and then play rook d6, that would be, that'd be perhaps just a winning position. But 
For Ding Liren, this is the second time that he makes it to the finals in the World Cup. And uh, two years ago, the story was pretty different because they drew all their classical games. Uh, that was a match against Levon Aronian in the finals in Tbilisi two years ago. And then he lost on tie breaks. This time, Ding Liren was more confident about his chances in the finals. He himself said that, well, he improved since. He was being very objective about it. Yeah. He didn't brag or anything. He's such a humble and down to earth grandmaster. But he said that his rating and his ranking improved since he was an underdog in that match against Levon Aronian. And now he's the favorite here to win the finals. Even if he loses today, it may be the case that tomorrow he plays a brilliant game with the white pieces and wins. Or, in case of a tie, he can win also in the playoffs. But it's just a strange feeling for him that a match that started so well and seemed to be so sure goes now the wrong way for him in this game three. So the feeling is like, like it, it's only a proof that he's human. Yeah. So that, that he, he's not Alpha Zero. Well, it's reassuring right, for Dean. us. Yeah. It's reassuring for us that he is a human, but uh, he definitely seemed unbeatable. Bishop to d6. Ah, oh, well. And that's, that's a very nice solution. Why to trade the rooks if your rook is more active, right? g6 is hanging. You've got to take on f5, and then king takes f5. And then yet another idea for this kind of endgame, that you are actually playing for, for the attack. Mm -hmm. You bring the king to g6, you are threatening checkmate, and it's your king which takes the h5 pawn. So you are absolutely right, in fact. Yeah? Takes on f5, king f5, there won't be that many moves played. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. This is How to stop king g6? Oh, Bishop, Bishop back g7. to g7 which is understandable in case of king g6, Ding Liren wants to play bishop f8, that's kind of the last trap, or rather, last try to hold the defense, but after king g5, yet another pawn falls. No, that, that's Completely absolutely hopeless. Position. Absolutely hopeless, yeah. And then, yeah, it's like, if you try to leave the things, a six rank, like, kill rook c3, attack the b3 pawn, I'm wondering how many moves win for white in this situation. What move are you going for in such situations, Anna? You and take on G7, handshake. I suspect. Ding Li re resigns, and that means that the other grandmaster, Tamer Javov, ties the score here in Hantimansisk with one more classical game to go. The finals are once again wide open. Anything can happen tomorrow, and in case of an, another draw tomorrow, that would be tie breaks on Friday. Uh, right, and, and in the other match, especially with this draw today, where Yu Yang Yi seemingly had chances, the tiebreak probability is also very, very high. As well, you know, if you make three draws, you, you are very, very solid. You might as well make draw number four. And we are going to wait for Tamer Ajabov to join us in the studio. Hopefully he's in the mood to analyze his game for you guys. We would love to have the other Grandmaster here talking through this game, about his thoughts, the critical moments, what went wrong. What a different picture yesterday, Ding Liren, brilliant game. We had him in the studio. Today it is Ding who is. He must be very disappointed about playing inaccurate moves and not getting out of that uh, slightly worse middle game that came out of the opening. Yeah, and once again, it, I'm so surprised because it seems, well, this harmless position after the, say, after White returns the pawn in this, in this line of the marshal. So basically, this position, this bishop e3, it seemed to be throughout studied. And, and actually, this, this setup, rook f to d8, was Ding Li Ren's improvement. Well, th that position has happened against Karyakin. There was Ding Li Ren's improvement on the previous play, which, by the way, see, seemed already good enough. So, the move which was played before that, I'm, I'm not really sure if it was. But perhaps there was something else instead of rook fd8. And it was already good enough. Then, Ding Li Ren against Karyakin played this rook fd8, a4 and rook a to c8. Made the draw, was a bit uncomfortable, but made the draw. So now, I would expect him to be super, you know, super confident and solid. 
And perhaps he was, but this surprising trade in 94 kind of confused him. It did. So Queen takes f5 one more time. A move 21 was the novelty of Tamer Rajabov. Yep. It will not shake the valuation of opening theory, but it's a try. And all you need is a playable position with some pressure by white. There were, there were problems in this position that uh, Ding Liren had to solve in the most precise way. He didn't find the most precise yep. way, and therefore he got into a worse position. Yeah, right. And then we can say that, uh, well, move 27 novelty in the marshal is too late. Right, that's what has happened in the first game, but move 21 is pretty much okay, <laughs> the position remains playable. Yeah, and I'm curious, what is it that Rajabov had in mind for the first game, because he said there, after the game, that he prepared something different than what he played, but he didn't like it, and decided to change his mind right before the game, call it a day. He literally said, said he was going to... Uh, go for a draw in that game, a lot changed since today he couldn't have that approach and in general he never had that approach so it was surprising that he would not fight with the white pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And, and could it be that that was particularly the line he meant? Maybe and he then discovered the details since he had a few more days to analyze him and his team because all of these players have their seconds working yeah. for them at home or here. Some of them come here with their seconds and trainers. Others have grandmasters helping them from home, analyzing why they sleep here because you also need sleeping time apparently. Uh, well, so once again, we are trying to. Yeah, I do believe we will have Timur in the studio, so I suspect we will have to go for a short technical break just to set the things up, and we'll come back with Timur Rajabov. Break while we are still on air, and we have Timur with us to join us. Uh, um, so we're going to go for a short break and then we are back with Grandmaster Timur Rajabov. So now it's Timur Rajabov has tied the score here in Huntiman Sisk by winning today against Ding Liren. Timur, what a comeback from yesterday. How yeah. did you do it? Well, actually, I um, almost didn't prepare at all. I had this line, I mean, I thought it for the, for the first game, but it seemed drawish to me because, I mean, there is, a, there is a, you know, this direct stuff there. So I decided to see if, if I can find something else. But uh, for today's game, somehow, you know, I just uh, woke up and said, okay, anyway, there is nothing nothing else to play so uh, I mean we'll just try this line and actually it's uh, it's a draw after um, after h4, rook a c8, queen f5, bishop f5, knight e4 but I mean if he knows uh, one move here which is very important the c5 uh, black simply makes a draw I mean it's not uh, I mean the lines are not simple but it's a draw uh, almost uh, immediately more or less I mean uh, uh, okay there is a chance to take and play bishop e5 and c4 but it's still a draw and uh, I mean, slight press probably, but um, I was just hoping that if he doesn't know this c5, then it becomes a bit tricky for him. And um, so after this, uh, uh, just one question yeah, in yeah. that moment. Uh, I think he spent about half an hour making the yeah. move bishop f8. When he started spending so much time, did you suspect that he will yeah. not play c5? Yeah, I saw that he might not play c5 because, uh, I mean, the lines there. I mean, they're not that simple in general. It's very simple for the computer after c5. Um, for example, if you take on d5, you have to see how you take the pawn back. Bishop b7 takes mm -hmm. a6, I'm winning the pawn, but okay, still this looks uh, probably drawish for even for the human eye. But um, I don't know exactly what he was uh, afraid after c5. It's, uh, I mean, would be nice to hear what, what, what was his thoughts, but certainly he has this in the notes, I'm sure. I, I mean, I'm more than sure that he has c5 in the notes. But after bishop f8, um, I saw it uh, today actually with Compi there and back after knight c5. Night before, this beautiful line was g6, a takes b5, c takes b5, knight e6, but it's actually a draw as well. 
Um, it's still a draw. <laughs> yeah, it's still a draw. I think after uh, bishop e6, rook e6, f takes e6, takes. So this is where I, I think knight c2 was the move. Um, mm. Rook c1, knight takes d4, c takes d4, and some a5 or something like this. And somehow it's uh, eventually it's a draw. But probably over the board, I don't know, even maybe rook takes d4 is possible. But uh, yeah, I mean, maybe over the board is uh, a bit complicated to see if it's, if it's a draw or not. Or maybe he was nervous here in general. But I think it's the best chance, knight c2. Somehow uh, I didn't study at all this rook c8, uh, c takes before, so I had to find out what to do here. But uh, okay, I mean, uh, either I make a direct draw here, so uh, by bishop uh, moving it to e5, for example, I thought it's just a draw after bishop g7. I should take king g7, rook a6, rook b4, rook a2, but okay, it's, uh, I mean, it's a miserable choice. I mean, it's just a, just a draw, mm -hmm. and king f6, h5, g5, whatever. So, um, yeah, so I had to find out what to do here, but uh, certainly this seemed as, uh, f at least for, for a while, posing problems. I'm sure it should be some kind of draw here as well. But at least, you know, for such a game, uh, when, when you need to draw so much, I think he completely um, uh, misplayed this position. Because after this, my play is just very simple. After bishop e7, rook c6, of course I have to defend the pawn, king g8, and now I just bring my pieces, I mean, bishop c5. Maybe somewhere he has to opt for bishop f8 or something like this, but... Um, Maybe bishop f8 actually is still a That still was going to be my question. Have you analyzed yeah. bishop f8 here as a possibility to yeah, it try looks to like a get the rook end game at least? Probably it's a draw as well. But I mean, it's like, I mean, okay, what, what else should I do? I mean, I, I don't have better moves probably. Yeah, obviously, so, you yeah. put the maximum pressure on him. And so after this, I was very surprised. When he played already king f7, I was surprised. So it means that he doesn't want to play bishop f8. Mm -hmm. But uh, once he keeps my bishop on c5, his rook is blocked on c6. Uh, my play is just very simple. It's the only thing not to allow. Probably he miscalculated this. I think he was calculating this from far. And after king g2, king e6, from far, he saw that after this, he can always go bishop c3 and a5. Yes. And that's a draw. But actually, after bishop c3, I'm just chasing the bishop, and then it's, yeah, then it's still, you know, rook c2. If he takes on before rook e2 check, and he has to move somewhere, maybe it still was a better chance, actually, than what he did. Because after h5, uh, h5, king f5, I'm just bringing my rook to d5, king to e4. So, I mean, maybe even bishop c3 was better here. Rook c2 and go back somewhere. Still threatening. Not threatening much, actually, yeah, anymore. Not threatening a5. No, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not threatening a5 anymore. So he'll have to go back and then mm, yeah, so bring probably the somewhere king. here he had to go for this bishop f8. Otherwise, I mean, this is like super simple for me. Uh, I mean, I was not sure if it's winning, but it's like, you know, I'm coming with my king to e4. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a dream position that I could get out of uh, everything I calculated today. So uh, this seemed like a real chance after this. I was kind of, you know, uh, surprised that he, he, he let me bring my king to e4. And this, uh, this is very bad. I think he had to go for bishop f8 somewhere. Probably there are some other draws. For example, after bishop f7, I thought maybe bishop takes b2. It should be close to a draw somewhere, but uh, still I'm posing some problems. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's what I had to do yeah, on such a high level. It's, uh, it's always something around uh, draw somewhere if, if uh, one of the openings plays the right move. So it's okay, but uh, anyway, still it was a good chance. So yeah, but after this I was... I mean, I would say I was shocked, but uh, because I mean I didn't expect to get this kind of easy play in this end game, so that I will play some rook end game with three pawns against two pit, and <laughs> that I still have some chances. But yeah, this um, okay. I still had to be precise here, I guess, because after a five king of seven, uh, I didn't see a direct win uh, except of what I did. I don't know. Probably there is some rook d7, d3, or rook d3 at first. I don't know. But after this. Uh, I think it's completely lost. I'm just, uh, you know, cutting the rook from uh, from the defense, and my king is just uh, coming to collect all the pawns, and also the mate is threatening with king g6, g6 all the time. Only thing is not to go king g6 here because of bishop f8, but uh, okay, uh, with all the exhaustion <laughs> I have still, I can see <laughs> such things. You were aware of the yeah, pin yeah. on yeah, the sixth yeah, rank. such things I can see still, yeah. It's an incredible okay. comeback, and we've been praising your opening choice since yeah, you mentioned that c5 would lead to a draw, but he has to remember it. So it was a test of uh, whether he remembers that analysis. Queen takes f5, according to our database, is a novelty, but he must have been aware of that. Uh, yeah, but the, line. the point is that after he played, I mean, for example, uh, let's assume that he plays c5. Yeah. And um, after this. I would go something, and it would, I mean, it would be drawish somewhere, like quite fast, to be honest. I mean, this should be a draw somehow. And uh, I mean, I have all the notes, but in general, I mean, it's just a draw in general. So um, 
And then it would be like, you know, everybody would say, why would you go for this position? Yeah. Because it's a forced draw. It's a very different approach. Two sides approach. of well, the same you coin, see, yeah, yes. Yeah. Once you see the, what happened in the game, you say that it's a great choice or something. But I wasn't uh, sure that it's a great choice, to be honest, uh, while going to the game today. And this is the line that you were going to play. Now we know that you had this in mind for the first well, game. I have a lot of lines in general that yeah. I can play, but uh, <laughs> some of them, you know, sometimes uh, during the preparation, before the games and stuff, uh, I mean, on the, on the professional level, sometimes there is this kind, of, um, this kind of hesitation before the game. Well, I mean, should you try this line or that one, or mm -hmm. something uh, seems risky at the last moment, and especially with all this, you know, uh, nerves and pressure and so on, you, you're just uh, not sure which line, uh, you know, to, to play. But uh, today, to be honest, uh, I mean, uh, I just thought, I mean, if he finds this, okay, 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 bye bye, and that's it. But if he doesn't, I mean, there is some play. So it finally, eventually, uh, went my way. That's uh, that's nice. Yeah, congratulations, Thank and you. I think you deserve it because uh, you did test him. And uh, luckily for us, uh, not even the best players in the world like you guys uh, will always remember your own yeah. opening analysis. So it was a good test for today. You made a comeback. There's one more classical game to be played tomorrow. Good luck for that game, and uh, once again, uh, we are just amazed that you made a comeback also from the psychological perspective where you had to forget yesterday's game. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much, thank you. And now we have an interview with Maxim Vashagrava and Yu Yangi about their game. Thanks. So we're here with Yu Yan Yi and Maxim Vashelagrav. So the third game of your match finished in a draw. Yan Yi, you were playing with the white pieces. Do you think that you have advantage in the opening? Yes, uh, yeah, I know um, I have a chance. Maybe Rudy one mistake. I think maybe Queen A3, yeah, maybe better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Maxim, do you agree with this? Um, yeah, I felt like I was in big trouble. I underestimated our uh, dangerous my position was, uh, especially after rook e2. I was mostly concerned about rook d2, knight e4, bishop e4, bishop e4, g3. But this is only slightly worse and probably all the ball. But after rook e2, I missed in advance things like b6, queen b4. And then uh, I'm just in some trouble with uh, how to avoid knight d5. And in the game, of course, uh, if he goes queen a3 instead of rook d1 allowing rook c1, I I didn't actually find uh, a continuation for me, so I mean, it very possibly could just be lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you are going to have white pieces in the final game of the standard time here, so what is your state of mind before it? Mm. It's one more game, so like one more, one more, one last effort. Uh, I mean, of course, there's uh, a possibility of tiebreak, but uh, uh, one last effort in classical. So I think uh, everyone's really exhausted, uh, and uh, you know, I'm still hoping to to get an interesting game uh, and to fight for something. But you know, we'll, we'll just have to see tomorrow, depending also on my. Uh, 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 shape. <laughs> yes, and Yan Yi, are you ready for defense tomorrow? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yes? Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you very much and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Comeback by Tamer Rajab of the ties the score in his match against Ding Liran for the first place. That will leave the battle wide open. Tomorrow is the last classical game. And we shall see if Ding Liran with the white pieces will manage to do the same what Rajab have achieved today. Slight pressure and there was a way out with C5 but Ding Liran had to remember it and it wasn't that simple. Yeah, right. Once again, a reminder of our score of the game. Three, both matches are tied at one and a half points each. And while three more or less quiet draws, well, with exception perhaps of today's game, when it wasn't so equalish between Maxime Vashielograv and Yu Yang Yi for the third place. But in the final, those players are on fire. So first... Ding Li Ren wins in a brilliant fashion, and then today Rajabov comes back and accuses us, by the way, of results-oriented thinking, because indeed, <laughs> would Ding Li Ren blitz out C5 and all the moves analyzed make a draw, and we would say, well, it was a very strange choice by Timur. But, but he's right, and that's how it works at top-level chess. Everything 
well, almost everything is so well analyzed that oftentimes, yes, it's a test whether you remember. And the same, we could say the same when um, Rajabov played against Vashel Lagrov. Rajabov came with an idea, but had Maxim remembered the line yeah, properly, the maybe setup, it would have been yeah. a draw and not a win for Rajabov qualifying to the next stage. So it is true. It is true that uh, knowing what happened in the game, that always influences um, the viewers and us, the casters, on how we think about his choice, whether it was good or not for today. It for was this a good moment, choice. It was a good choice. It worked out. And tomorrow will be a really exciting game between these two. Also in the other match where Yu Yang Yi must have missed his chance today in this yeah. game. He had a couple of moments where it seemed that he has an advantage and Maxime is struggling. In the end, he didn't find anything, traded queens, and then they agreed in a draw. Yeah, so, and for tomorrow, yeah, once again, it's a psychological situation which I believe will be comfortable for Maxime Vachiel Grove. Depends, of course, like, like he said in the interview, we are all exhausted and I'll first of all see how I'm going to feel tomorrow. But yeah, after escaping, uh, you know, a tough situation, having White in the last game, well, he might, fail, might feel, you know, some energy to play for a win. They should try to problems, find that energy, yeah. even if the players have been here in Siberia for almost a month by now. It's a very lengthy tournament, started with 128 players, and now we are witnessing the final stage. Tomorrow is the last classical game, come back for this one game, and in case of a tie, if the score is tied, we will see tie breaks on Friday. So this is the final two days of the event. Thank you so much for being here, and we will be here tomorrow, same time, same place.